Good morning to everybody. We are starting now with the second day. The first session is dermatology, so I would like to invite the chairman to the podium. Okay, good morning everyone. Thank you for coming on a Sunday morning. We are now starting with our most international session, dermatology, as Daniel said. Uh, I invite um, Ivona Jovanowska on the pro side and from Skopje, Macedonia, and Dora Stepan from Ljubljana on the contra side, and our only international mentor, Maida Kusuta from Italy, to join me here. Please start and convince us if acne and diet, it's a binomial that makes sense. Okay, so good morning everyone. I'm Ivona from the medical faculty in Skopje, Macedonia. This is my colleague Dora from Slovenia. Hello. So the, today's first presentation will be about uh, one of the most common skin disorders, and that is acne. Uh, our uh, main topic of the presentation will be uh, to, uh, to get the relationship between the acne and the diet. So I'm standing from the pro side, which means I strongly uh, support the theory that the acne has a major role in the acne pathogenesis as well as its treatment. And uh, Dora will try to deny my argument. So go ahead, Dora. Yes. You know, first. Hello, everyone. Um, so yeah, I will try to convince you that diet is not everything, and we have also other approach to treatment and uh, to treatment of acne. So if we start, what are acne? This is a skin disease that affects um, the pilosebaceous follicles, uh, so they become plugged with oil and that skin cells. Um, acne very commonly occur uh, in adolescence or in young adulthood, uh, and they are not dangerous in the aspect that person couldn't walk or talk, but they can have a very profound psychological and social impact on patients. And if you know, if you knew maybe this, but uh, the acne are the second common cause among uh, the, uh, skin, uh, the patients with skin disease that would commit a suicide. So the little bit of pathogenesis of acne, pathogenesis of acne, uh, the most important role here play, are played by androgens because they can increase the sebum production uh, and also, uh, they can cause the abnormal follicular desquamation, which leads to hyperkeratinization. Uh, and all of this combined, uh, it can lead to propioni bacterium acne colonization and proliferation. And at the end, what, what is the most important thing here is this perifollicular inflammation, which actually causes this acne. Uh, it can be shown in very... Uh, Variety in variety um, in variety pictures in clinical presentations, and it's, mo it's most commonly shown on our face, neck, back, shoulders, and chest. Uh, and we can have uh, white heads, which are clogged white pores. Uh, it can be seen as black heads, which is just the oil exposed to the air, and it turned uh, brown or uh, black when it's exposed to the air. Then we have um, papulas, which are small red tender bumps, pustulas, which are just uh, papulas with pus in it. And then the worst, there are cystic lesions uh, or nodulas, which can cause scars that, can, that patients can have for the rest of their life. So what are the risk factors? Uh, the most common, so it's just puberty and all it comes with it. So the hormonal changes, mostly it's increase of the andro androgens. Then the family history, so it has a genetic component as well. Then we have uh, overuse of greasy or oily substances if we don't need it. So if we, have, if we have greasy skin and if we are using greasy substances, this can actually be a risk factor for acne. And the friction or pressure on our skin. Um, person on average touches their face 16 times per hour. Who is touching their face right now? You don't even know about this. But you can spread the bacteria all around. So, and then the factors that may worsen acne, again, are hormones. Um, so any kind of imbalance of the hormones. Then we have certain medications, usually they contain hormones, diet that you will soon hear about from Ivona, and then the stress. So now, what is the myth and what is the truth behind acne? Ivona, what do you have? 
Okay, so now I'll try to explain what's that uh, thick relationship between the diet and the acne. Uh, in recent times, there are more and more researches done and uh, new articles and studies are published with, uh, which try to convince us that uh, actually the, uh, the diet has uh, a very big influence on the acne pathogenesis. So now I will present you some um, food products that are uh, and somehow uh, enemies to the acne. Uh, for instance, isotretinoin, uh, that's a retinoid that derives from the uh, metabolism of the vitamin A. So uh, it directly uh, affects the, uh, all four uh, pathogenic factors of the acne and it is more, uh, most efficient in the sebum suppression. Next, uh, the well-known uh, active metabolite from the vitamin D. So uh, its major role it is that it regulates the growth and the differentiation of the carotinocytes, which means it has a big anti-proliferative effect. Uh, as a proof of that, uh, a very uh, lot of um, analogs to the vitamin D are used as a treatment for psoriasis, so it is uh, a very, it's a hyperproliferative uh, skin disorder. Um, next, uh, we have here some uh, important uh, nutrition from our diet, the minerals, such as zinc, copper, and iron, so um, uh, uh, they influence on the uh, both anti-inflammatory and inflammatory enzymes. Talking about the fatty acids, so we all know that the fatty acids are a very important part of our everyday diet and clinical imbalances can lead to a, a variety of skin problems. So uh, the linoleic and alpha-linoleic acids are one of the uh, fatty acids that the human uh, cells can't produce, so they need to be obtained by the everyday diet. And uh, they are precursors to many omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids families. And um, they, uh, so, uh, they, have, uh, they are involved in many physiological processes in our body, including inflammation. So the omega-6 fatty acids induce pro-inflammatory mediators, and the omega-3 fatty acids decrease the inflammatory factors. Now the milk, I guess, uh, is one of the favorite milks of ev uh, favorite drinks of everyone. But uh, recently, uh, there are a lot of new studies. They are trying to convince us that actually the milk is not that good as we thought it is, because there are a few, let's say, bad things about it. First of all, it has a high glycemic index. Uh, what's the glycemic index? So it shows how rapidly uh, it. Um, it shows how rapidly a carbohydrate is digested and it is released as a sugar into the blood system. So as the milk has a high glycemic index, uh, it uh, leads to uh, more production of insulin, which then leads to insulin resistance. And the insulin itself is a, a growth factor and the growth factors are one of the triggers for the, uh, for the acne production. More of that, uh, the milk contains a lot of hormones, growth hormones, steroid hormones, other bioactive proteins, and peptides, which are also included in the pathogenesis of the acne. And uh, as we're on the carbohydrates, I would like to mention also the glycemic load. Uh, the glycemic load measures the amount of uh, carbohydrates in a serving of a food. So uh, what does happen when uh, we consume uh, a food with a high glycemic index? So that will, um, that will lead to a hyperinsulinemia, when then infects with uh, uh, androgen and other uh, uh, hormones imbalances, with, uh, when then it leads to changes in the sebum composition. Okay. Yes, this is true, but there are also other factors that um, food, uh, I mean, food is not the only factor that can impact acne or cause them or worsen them. We also should not forget about the genetic, fa genetic factors. Uh, so there was this study, twin study, based on 1,557 pairs of twins, and it actually showed the strong genetic basis uh, for acne. Uh, and these were the genes that were related to androgen and steroid metabolism. And furthermore, they have additive genetic effects. So uh, the younger generations of the parents would be affected even more severely than their parents. Um, 
but that was, yes, this was uh, the study of for genetics. So there is a genetic uh, component. Then we should not forget about the role of this bacteria, Propionibacterium uh, Propioni acnes, uh, because this is the predominant resident on microorganism on sebaceous gland rich areas on our skin. We all have this bacteria, but uh, it can be more severe in other people, in some people than the others. And there is a very great cor correlation between uh, the level of those bacteria and the sebum production. Because the sebum production can act as a nutrient for, the, for these bacteria, uh, so their level can increase in case of sebum production is increased as well. Uh, and the problem is that those bacteria, uh, they can resist the phagocytosis and can persist intracellularly uh, within macrophages for a very prolonged periods. So sometimes uh, antibiotics wouldn't really help and we can actually make a resistance. Um, and then also uh, the hormonal effects on the acne, um, as we heard before, so uh, the puberty and the uh, Raised of uh, the raised levels of uh, androgens can cause acne, but also there is this one very common endocrine disorder in uh, reproductive aged women, so polycystic ovary syndrome. Uh, this can affect up to 10 to 50 percent of women, and the signs are hyperandrogenism. So this leads to hirsutism, acne vulgaris, androgenic alopecia, and also chronic anovulation and polycystic ovaries. Uh, but this can be treated very well with hormones. Um, and also, uh, there, I must say, there is not enough research about this, but it is m commonly known that during the exam periods when we are all stressed out, our skin can be, uh, the condition on our skin can be worse, uh, can worsen, because we elicit uh, cortisol and also the substance P, and those two can promote the development of cytoplasmic organelles in sebaceous cells, and not only they increase the size of individual sebaceous cell, but they can also promote uh, the proliferation and the differentiation of sebation glands. So try to stress less. And now, can we treat acne? So now we've seen what can worsen them or what can cause the acne, but can we actually treat them? Because this is very important, because some patients have acne that can, have, uh, that can lead to scars they can have for the rest of their life. And by uh, treating them, we can prevent uh, psychological distress, disfiguring, and scaring. So how is it possible? Yeah, to... of course it's possible because uh, the, um, yeah, the, da the food can be both used as a prevention and also as a medicine for the acne. Uh, so uh, now here I have two studies. Uh, that uh, prove us that uh, actually we can use uh, the we can use the diet as a treatment for our acne problems. Uh, there was a study in which uh, there were uh, uh, 32 uh, persons with mild to moderate acne lesions, and uh, uh, half of them were under um, a strict low glycemic low diets. That means the, the diet consisted of 45% of carbohydrates, 25% uh, of proteins, and 30% uh, of fats. And the other group was under a, a, a diet that was uh, very rich on carbohydrates. Rates, and the results were that the ones that uh, consumed this low glycemic load diet uh, showed significant clinical and histopathological improvements in the acne lesions. By histopathological, I mean a decrease in uh, the number of the inflammatory cells as well as some inflammation mediators as, uh, for example, the interleukin-8. In, uh, in the other study, um, there were uh, also 80 people included, so 40 of them uh, were uh, with acne and 40 of them were without acne. And the both groups were given detailed questionnaires about their milk and other dairy products consumption. And also they were asked to lead uh, like a, a three days food diary, so what they are consuming. And uh, it was concluded that the glycemic load, the frequency of milk and ice cream ingestion were positively associated with the acne. Um, then here I have a chart in which you can see uh, which foods are uh, with the low glycemic load and index in which one uh, has the high glycemic index. So you can conclude the, which are our friends and which are our enemies. And uh, considering all of this, now what would you choose? 
I know that the left one looks more tasty for most of you, I guess. But with the, these two photos, uh, I wanted to, uh, to give a short description of the two world's two uh, main uh, type of diet. So that's the Western and the non-Western type of diet. Uh, so here we go with the Western type of diet. Uh, so it consists of uh, nearly 50% of car carbohydrate, of which uh, a big part are refined carbohydrates, then 50% of proteins and 35% uh, of fats, uh, which uh, most of them are saturated fats, and also uh, a very important data that shows us the ratio between the omega-6 and the omega-3 uh, fatty acids is 10 to 1. In contrast, in the non-Western diets, the ratio is only 3 to 1. I think a very big difference. So here I have some examples of uh, non-Western diets. For example, the Mediterranean diet, which is in general a low glycemic load diet uh, that has a lack of diary. As you can see, the, uh, the diary products are just on the top of the pyramid. Then uh, they have increased intake of omega-3 fatty acids, and uh, there were uh, case control studies which proved that uh, this kind of diet actually serves a, uh, as a protective role in the acne. Another uh, uh, non-Western diet is the South Beach diet, which uh, is uh, with, in which unprocessed fresh, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables are included, also lean meats and a lot of fish and seafood. So as you can see, uh, the food can be a very good medicine for our acne problem. Yes, but I think it can more work as a preventive way because if the patient has a very or if the patient has a very severe case of acne, the only thing that is effective are those medicines right here uh, that we can directly influence on the receptors or the sebum production or so. I will explain it um, soon. So we have anti-comedogenic substances uh, known as, uh, oh, uh, so retinoids, isotretinin, very effective. Anti-inflammatory substances, antimicrobial substances, and hormonal treatment. So now let's just take a brief look of those few groups. So antimicrobial substances, yes, we can reduce by this uh, uh, the bacterial colonization of the deeper parts of the follicle, and we are mostly using tetracycline, minocycline, and doxycycline, but we have to be very careful because of the antibiotic resistant. Uh, we can actually make um, few, like we can actually make those bacteria more resistant and more prone to any kind of medication, and it's hard to get rid of them after. So we should be very careful by using antibiotics. Uh, then the other treatment is hormonal treatment. Uh, so we are using oral contra contraceptives, androgen receptor blockers, corticosteroids, and inhibitors of 5-alpha reductase. Uh, but it is not usually the first choice of treatment because this can also affect uh, other parts of the body, I mean other systems uh, in the body. So the most effective way usually for very severe acne are retinoids. retinoids um, and these are the um, cell signaling molecules, and they derive from uh, vitamin A. Uh, and they can actually, um, they have the very great impact on the cell proliferation and differentiation, because they can decrease that. And also they have sebostatic function, which is very important, because also the sebum itself can cause inflammation, not only the bacteria, but also just the sebum. And then it has keratolytic function, so it decreases the hyperkeratinization and also anti-inflammatory properties. So it looks like the perfect medicine, but it can also have um, advert, uh, I mean side effects. Uh, but very important is that it can be helpful because this can actually reduce uh, the sebation gland size uh, up to 90%. Uh, so the patient really get rid of acne. Yeah, so you had very convincing arguments. So I would say that um, actually we uh, we can't say there is a, a strict uh, like a strict uh, proof of what's the cause and what can we use as a treatment for the acne. So uh, as a conclusion, because uh, the, the the acne is one multifactorial condition which depends on many factors. So there is no complete single treatment for the acne yet, although we can prevent it with use using various of, uh, prevent and treat it with using ver uh, various of remedies, also decreasing our stress level and in a big percentage eating the proper diet, which is very important. 
Yes, I have to agree here with Ivona to this level that uh, these are all the factors that are important. But again, I think when it comes to the severe cases of acne, when this can leave scars for the rest of your life, I think here is the medicine when it comes in uh, so it can actually treat the acne, the acne. Yes. Okay, so any questions? From the audience? <laughs> Please start with your questions. If not, I will. <laughs> okay, um, you said that acne can have or has a genetic base. So I would say uh, the diet, you should start with this as a prevention, like since birth, or, or maybe it's enough to start with this, I don't know, uh, before puberty, because maybe children are not so happy if you say, no, you shouldn't eat milk chocolate. So maybe if we're, I don't know, where there are six, they can eat everything they want, kind of, and then start with more restrictive diet, like you know, no diary products or something. Yeah. If you don't know. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I think that, uh, as we said, it is a multifactorial condition, so we have to be aware of many factors. So maybe as the, the children can eat milk and chocolate, but all in, uh, in uh, limits, you know? So the parents should uh, be aware that uh, uh, that kind of food uh, can be uh, bad for their health. So. Uh, I think, yeah, from, from the childhood, maybe it's good to, um, to get a good uh, habits in, uh, in the children's uh, um, everyday diet. Yeah. Yes, because we, we can also say them that not only, it, it won't only impact their acne, but also their whole body system if they yeah. eat the proper food. So we should, yeah, I think it's... And as Dora said, also the genetics, yeah, may play some role in it. But we can't strictly uh, make a difference that, yes, if we eat healthy food, then we won't have acne. Or, for example, my mother has a lot of acne, and I will surely have them. Mm -hmm. So we can't make a strict uh, division. And I also think there are cases that there are, um, we cannot treat this with food. If there is a really strong genetic component, especially with these bacteria that can be very severe and very hard to treat, I think there is no diet that can help Okay, there is no this. prevention. Yes, in no, genetic. there is no prevention. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. we should go with medicines in the area. A question? Sure. Wait. Yes. Like for women, they need to have the birth control during they take it. And um, I want to know for lo how long do you need to take them? Because is it that it's a cure of the acne or is it just, yeah, so you take it for one year, you take it for three years, you take it your no, no, no. lifelong. <laughs> so that's maybe also very important to know because it's really a hard treatment, I guess. Yes. It's very important, uh, when do we get this medicine? So how old are we? If there is, because um, we were just discussing it with my mentor, uh, and if you, get, uh, if you get this very bad acne when you are about 14, 15 years old, uh, this, uh, this treatment usually lasts for four months with retinoids, uh, but then it should be, uh, they should take it again after a year or so. So acne can happen again. But if you get uh, this kind of bad acne when you are 18 or older, only one treatment is usually needed, and it's for four months again. And then that it's can be. Kind but of it's cute. very important for yeah. women not to be pregnant. I mean, this can have, because it can be uh, very bad for the baby. So is it always the first choice, or is it like, because the hormones and like birth control pill is also a hormone, so is it not more common to say, well, you're in the age, as we're talking about women now, that they take, try first the as of the hormones, or is it really the retroids they take first? I don't think there is, I think it depends on the, I don't I think they always maybe. start with retinoids. Yeah. I think it, there are so many different studies, I am not sure about this. No, uh, I see uh, the age of the patients. Yeah. Uh, when the patient is uh, 80, you can uh, start with this tretinoin. And for uh, younger patients, women, you must go to obstetrician, gynecologist for uh, the study because they mm, can be PCOS or other problems. Uh, this is the between uh, dermatologist and uh, gynecologist. It's not uh, only one specialist for, for this uh, kind of acne. Yeah, 
Thank you. What would you say about women taking uh, peroral contraceptives? Are they more or less uh, proved for the ECNA? And are there any differences? They should be less. Taking less. Affected, yes. and are there any differences taking different variants? Yes, it, it, it very important um, where this progesterone derives from, uh, because it can actually cause. They can have actually both ways we can get from this contraceptive. Uh, actually, one, they can increase the levels, especially the old generations of these contraceptives. Um, and they can actually raise the levels of androgens at the end, so they can actually worsen the acne. But then these new generations, like the third generations, uh, they are just the pure progesterone. Uh, they can actually reduce the acne, and they can really help, yes. But sometimes when they stop taking them, this can all go much worse then. So should be careful. Yeah, you should always consult the doctor about this. So. So what about the diet that you said not all the people benefit from the diet? Besides, like you said, the genetic factor that is very important. Yes. Do we know there's any other factor that we know that they will not benefit from the diet or that, like we know which one will actually benefit or which one will not? You can try on your own, <laughs> see if it's working. Um, but yeah, I think it's hard to say. Um, Maybe it's also, also, for example, the stress. Some people stress more, some people stress less, for example. And in some stress can cause very bad acne. Uh, it's also how you are, um, how, how is your inflammatory response to it? Because this is the most what causes acne, is inflammatory response usually. So I think in that case, you cannot really help with acne. It really depends um, on your immune system as well. Um, and no. It's uh, important, maybe in some cases, uh, acne is not acne, but a allergic folliculitis. And it's very, uh, um, probably in uh, nickel allergy. Nickel allergy is, uh, I think, 20% in some population uh, positive. And when you uh, give the right diet without uh, so much nickel, the people get better. That's, uh, that I see every day in my practice. I have uh, young uh, women with uh, very strong folliculitis and only with diet uh, they get better. But it's not enough diet. It's, mm, it's multifactorial. Yeah. We have to know this all the time. Yes. There, many, there won't many be only conditions. one way that can help treat the acne. Usually you have to combine things so and some things works best for others and some things for others it's with a low nickel intake uh -huh. <laughs> you can see on uh, um, Google and you can <laughs> see uh, I think four five different diets because it's a different uh, response with different women. You can get, have um, uh, the Western diet with, it, uh, with um, a great intake of nickel because there are uh, cans uh, with nickel, you have uh, tuna with nickel, you have uh, mushroom with nickel, uh, tomato. Um, the ketchup, it's a great contain, uh, have a great contain of nickel, um, margarina, etc., fatty, and it's with nickel combined, it's a lot of things. They should add as the food labels, not just gluten free, sugar free, also nickel free. Uh, yeah, yeah. May, maybe it's most important because nickel uh, causes allergy in all uh, ages, not in uh, young person, but uh, to in very old. And but I'm, but I'm it's not uh, enough. I'm afraid that also the uh, chocolate myth is deriving from the nickel theory, because chocolate itself, I mean, dark chocolate shouldn't be. No, it's uh, not bad. But it has a lot of nickel. So maybe this is the connection between like people thinking that chocolate provokes acne? No, no, no. No? no. <laughs> Nutella is the worst no, thing <laughs> because it uh, has a citrate fatty acid uh, that itself pro provokes worse, uh, worse the acne 
and uh, mm, citrate uh, acid made with nickel. There are two things in one. So and dark chocolate is good? Maybe it's good when it's made with uh, right chocolate, not uh, with less soy lecithin and other saturated fatty acids. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have one more question. What about uh, yogurts without added sugar? Uh, yogurt, it's, uh, a it's dairy. And um, yogurt, uh, when it's true yogurt, not uh, another thing of milk drink, uh, it's good. But uh, we have evidence that uh, milk drinks uh, like yoga or other uh, serum proteins uh, act on um, insulin uh, uh, in uh, in that, mm, it rises it, yes, rises insulin load, and it's very worse for acne. Uh, all uh, dairy products, the refined or I can see uh, uh, industrialized products, uh, have a high uh, insulin load, and it's not it's worse for acne. Okay, okay thank the you. last question, I think. Uh, yeah, what about um, some indigenous tribes that, for example, lives in Amazon forest that actually don't have any um, connection with modern diet, with processed nickel uh, foods? They, they and don't have acne. They don't have acne at all. No. So there are no documented cases? Yes, 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 it's documented. Uh, the first um, intuition uh, about the difference uh, between Western diet and non-Western diet, uh, it's from these uh, um, studies. It was studies uh, made in Nova Guinea and in Paraguay, and uh, they see that uh, in this uh, population was no acne. Uh, maybe uh, yeah, there are genetic. Uh, genetic factors, but when this population came in England or in the United States, they have acne, how, how the others? Perfect. Uh, we had quite a discussion. We can now uh, thank Ivona and Dora for their excellent presentation. And I am now inviting um, on the pro side, Maria Jovanowska, also from Skopje, Macedonia, and on the contra side, Maya Michelic from Ljubljana. Please come, and we will see which is the thin line between good and bad when we talk about sunbathing. Because summer is coming, you know. Good morning, dear colleagues. Uh, we're so happy that the sun is up today so because we're going to talk about rather happy theme. I'm Maria Jovanovska. I come from Macedonia, Skopje. And I'm Maja Mihilic from Slovenia. And we would also like to thank our mentor Maria Kosuta for all her help and advices. So first, some basics for better understandings. We have UVA, UVB, and UVC rays, although the last one is not so important for us as it doesn't get through the ozone layer. However, being less energetic, UVA reaches the dermis and causing less obvious damage. It induces reactive oxygen spe species, which later alter, alter proteins, lipids, and DNA. It is also responsible for skin aging and some cancers um, of the skin. As for UVB, it is biologically more active. However, only 5% of it reaches the earth. It penetrates to the superficial layers of the um, skin down to the suprabasal epidermis. It has bile effect, dial DNA damage, which causes uh, mutagenic lesions, uh, and it also produces reactive oxygen species, which are responsible for sunburns and inflammation. So skin is the most vulnerable part of the body, and I'll show you all the specters of, its negative, of radiation's negative effects. 
After this introduction from Maya, I'm going to continue with the proverb from the ancient Romans. It says, sine sole silio, it means without sun I'm silent. So there are numerous beneficial effects that the sun has on us. But one of the most important three are the vitamin D production, uh, the, the heliotherapy, and of course the positive psychological effect. The vitamin D, uh, we take vitamin D with our diet, but uh, as itself, uh, it, it's inactive in our body. So in order to be activated and then used in our body, uh, we, we have to have sun. Only the 1.22 dihydrovitamin D is active. And it goes in 1,000 different genes that are governed through our body. It maintains the blood levels of calcium and phosphor, and in this uh, way it builds and maintains the bones. It uh, influences on the renin, and in this way it down-regulates the blood pressure. It also, it's also cardioprotective because the vascular muscles in, um, uh, in the cells have vitamin D receptors. Also, vitamin D uh, controls the cell division and specialization, and, in the whole, it, and it also has influence in the immune system. Uh, the psychological effects of the sun uh, are due to two substances. Mostly, they are the serotonin and the melatonin. The serotonin is a neurotransmitter in our body that regulates the appetite, the sleep, the memory, and the mood. Um, that's why we were so happy uh, today when we saw the sun. Uh, the sun always makes us better mood, uh, we have better sleep, and in the contrary, usually in winter, when there is no sun, we feel anxious, we feel fatigued, there are changes in our sleep pattern, we suffer from depression. The melatonin, um, it's a substance that regulates the circadian rhythm, the, the day and night rhythm. It's a strong antioxidant. Uh, it uh, has uh, influence in the cognitive functions, basically memory and learning. It's used in antihypertensive therapy, and it's a drug that is used in the delayed sleep phase disorder. It's connected with the sun in such ways that the melatonin rhythm phase is advanced when exposure to bright morning light. But Maria, what about premature skin aging? We know that in our society, this is a sign of oldness, and it can really lower our, our self-esteem. Premature skin aging is actually the most frequent long-term uh, change after the chronic sun exposure. In skin, in normal skin, there are some enzymes called metalloproteinases, which are normally responsible for the skin regeneration. However, being sun exposed, they become overactive, which um, which fo is followed by the disturbed production of the collagen and uh, elastin fibers. Collagen uh, becomes, uh, de uh, de uh, becomes degraded and deformed, and uh, this is seen as reduced skin firm firmness and also deep wrinkles. On the other side, elastin fibers become curled and damaged, and this is called solar elastosis. It is best observed on face, neck, and shoulders, so where the sun reaches the skin, but however, this is more of an aesthetic problem than medical. But we also have some medical problems. This is, for example, photoallergic reaction. This presents just a few minutes after the sun exposure and is actually the first side effect um, presenting after the sun exposure. We have two types, photoallergic reaction as a side effect of some drugs and aller allergic contact dermatitis. They are both uh, type 4 hypersensitivity response, hence they are mediated by the cells. Yes, that's all right, but that's bad. But um, UVB radiation has also some positive effects. Uh, it enhances the mood. It uh, gives us a feeling of relaxation. And this is due to the cutaneous endorphins that are uh, in our body when sun exposed. Also, the neuropeptide substance P uh, that is released from the sensory nerve fibers, uh, it increases the lymph lymphocyte proliferation. Also, there is increased activity of T-regulatory cells and upregulation of cytokines, uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha and interleukin 10. And also, when exposed to sun, the alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone is produced and it, uh, there is suppression of contact hypersensitivity. 
I'll go even further. We have also sunburns. These are not caused by a heat, but by an energy-rich short-wave UVB rays. So we mustn't confuse that them with skin reddening, which occurs immediately after the sun exposure and is uh, because of the temporary vasodilatation. Um, these atypical burns are actually seen as an inflammatory skin reaction induced by reactive oxygen spe species, which are induced by UVE and UVB rays. So both are very dangerous for skin, uh, sunburns. Yes, that's dangerous, but also sun can be very, very much used in healing some diseases. Uh, the heliotherapy is a therapy that comes from the words helios, uh, it's the god of the sun that the ancient Greeks had. Actually, the first um, uh, doctor that uh, used hypo, um, that advocated the sun's healing properties was Hippocrate. And, um, the first uh, heliotherapy was actually performed here in Slovenia, in the Lake of Vlad. It was a physician from Austria that um, had tuberculosis, and he, he went to the Lake of Vlad and saw that the sun has many, many good effects on, um, uh, on its tuberculosis. And um, from the late 800 years, uh, the heliotherapy is the key treatment for um, diseases like tuberculosis, like psoriasis. In psoriasis, it suppresses the immune system and it reduces the inflammatory response. In atopic dermatitis, depression, also in some others, like the rickets. The vitamin D induces uh, catelcidine, and it's a polypeptide uh, that combats uh, both bacterial and viral infections. Also, the neonatal jaundice is treated uh, with um, heliotherapy. The rheumatoid arthritis, we all know that in northern countries where there is no sun, the um, um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis is uh, more prone to, um, to it's more severe. And also in the inflammatory bowel disease and systemic, uh, systemic lupus erythematosus. Surely there are some positive effects, but what about all the in, uh, dangerous situations sun can cause? Mm -hmm. Because it's a common fact that more than 65% of melanoma and more than 90% of non-melanoma skin cancers are due to uh, sun exposure. UVB, as mentioned, has uh, bile, um, have bile uh, effect. They have di direct DNA damage. This is mainly uh, by causing uh, dimers, DNA strand breaks, and crosslinks. And if those are not repaired, this is um, followed by a genome mutation and uh, can also lead to a carcinogenesis. As this is not enough, they also uh, play a role in chronic inflammation actually in all three stages. And this cr chronic inflammation is, is induced with UVA and UVB rays. Uh, yeah, rays. Furthermore, as Maria w uh, mentioned in a positive way, they also have immunosuppressive effect on the skin. But if um, they actually stimulate the, um, this suppressive effect as, the, uh, as they increase the suppressive cytokines, Therefore, malignant cells are not detected and cannot be rejected, so cancers can develop easily. What uh, gives a great concern is that the incident is increasing enormously, and is it observed even with younger and younger patients. We have two types, squamous uh, carcinoma cell and basalioma. Carcinoma cell uh, cancer is observed best on face and ears, and it can present on or normal or previously damaged skin, and another one is basalioma, which is best observed on head, neck, and nose. Yes, but vitamin D has also some positive effects. It increases the self-destruction of the mutated cells in cancer, and um, in cancers, it causes cells to become more differentiated. It reduces the spread and reproduction of the cancer cells. Um, there are uh, some studies that show that actually vitamin D can prevent 16 types of cancer, uh, including pancreatic, lung, ovarian cancer, and also the cancer of the skin. So that's 600,000 all in all can uh, cases in breast and colorectal cancers that could be prevented if persons are uh, exposed to normal sunlight. Uh, so this is an overall cancer cut by 60%, uh, which led the Canadian Cancer Society to begin endorsing the vitamin as a cancer prevention therapy. Um, 
There is this study of the indoor workers, and this supplies the fact that UVB radiation um, is strongly connected with the vitamin D uh, activation in our body. Actually, the indoor workers are exposed only to UVA radiation, but not UVB radiation that is uh, in charge of the vitamin D production. So uh, they have three to nine times less solar UVB, UV exposure than the outdoor workers get. And this leads to increase, increased rates of melanoma in the workers that work inside. Of course, there are some benefits for indoor workers, but outdoor workers still get a lot of uh, sun exposure because we know for melanoma the, the greatest risk is UV radi radiation. There are of course some other risk factors written above but none of them is as important as UV radiation. And uh, also so many studies conducted that childhood with adolescence is a critical period of sun exposure because the skin is not um, so deformed at that time and we can uh, develop some changes for then older life. And also, there were a great uh, study uh, which took place over 20 years. It was reported that women that uh, reported having sunburns during second, third, and fourth decade of life have increased the risk for the melanoma. We all know that solarium is not good for our skin. However, it is the um, worst during 20 to, uh, to 29 years of age. To, um, to, uh, to show you some examples that uh, convince you that this is really, uh, that the sun exposure really is not that great, there were two studies. First, observed lower socioeconomic groups, and they, they uh, saw that they have lower incidence and higher m mortality. Why? Because they spend more time outside as outdoor workers, and also they, they have less awareness. So they become late to a doctor, and it is too late. And also, the greatest um, change in the incidence of melanoma was observed in northern country, uh, countries during the European population because they tend to have low background UV radiation, they have low northern latitude, and also mostly cloudy cover. However, now they adapted new trends of life. They travel uh, to southern areas to get better suntan and so on and then their skin is just not uh, prepared for that. So the, uh, the incidence of melanoma increased enormously in those countries. So I hope I, I convince you that intermittent pattern of sun exposure really is a high risk for melanoma, but there are some others, genetics predisposition as well. Those are number of navy, skin reaction to chronic sun exposure, and color of the skin and hair. However, the last one is the most important, because blonde hair people have twofold and red hair people even fourfold higher risk for melanoma. To conclude everything, in uh, women the best observed place are in extremities and trunk, and in males, trunk, head, and neck. So through all my um, presentation, I hope I convinced you that all the side effects of the sun are observed best on the part of the skin that sun reaches us the most. Maya, you have some great points there, but there, there is some recent evidence that actually, as she said, it's a multifactorial um, thing. So there is this recent evidence that shows that non-pigmentation associated polymorphisms may be one of the major importance in risk of developing uh, malignant melanoma. Also, uh, the malignant melanoma um, in the presence of higher vitamin D is thinner, is less aggressive, and there are greater survival rates. Also, the sun-associated malignant melanoma uh, is spread superficially in contrast to the nodular melanoma, which is uh, with worse prognosis. Also, there are also some many genetic variations that appear to have a great role as a risk factor for, for multiple melanoma. I'm going to try to convince you with this 20-year-long study that was conducted in the northern countries in Scandinavia. It consisted about 3,000 uh, 3, uh, women, and um, they were women that were exposed to sun, that they were women that were not exposed to sun at all. And what happened, uh, they had, at the end of this 20-year-old study, um, they had 2,545 deaths uh, amongst um, 
they were in cancer, in heart disease, and cerebrovascular disease. So all-cause mortality was inversely related to the sun exposure habit in a dose-dependent manner. So the mortality rate um, in these uh, avoiders of sun population was twofold raised as compared to those with the highest sun exposure habits. Also, women who avoided sun exposed exposure uh, were at increased risk of all-cause death with a two-fold increased mortality rate. And also women that were normally exposed in a normal moderate way were not significantly increased in risk of malignant melanoma. So I hope this convinced you that the sun in a moderate way has a protective role and it does not cause malignant melanoma by itself. So, to conclude... Yeah, what we would like for you to remember, UV radiation has triple effect um, of, the, of the damaging of the skin. This is direct and indirect DNA damage and also uh, suppression of the immune system. Uh, the vitamin D, which is strictly connected to the sun exposure, has a protective role in skin cancer and many other cancers. Of, of, of course, one of the best Kiss uh, here is that the sun uh, gives, our better, gives us better mood. So we agree that probably the strong increase of the incidence and the survival might be due to the extensive changes, changes in sun bathing habits and also uh, the increase of the awareness by the med medical community. So the conclusion is that middle ground approach that focuses on modal sun exposure is the best at the end. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. We can now start with the questions. Oh, the first one. Yeah, what? Extent, uh, recommended amount, like for a normal person, how, how much should uh, a person go expose themselves to the sun, if at all? Or? So in this study that was conducted in the northern countries, because they don't have much sun there, these women that went once, twice, or three times per year on a sunny holiday, but with moderate um, exposure to sun. So not to laying all the time on the beach and not getting sunburns, but moderate exposure, they had the best um, benefits of the sun. And of course not between the 10th and uh, 4 yes. p.m. But what is the moderate? Because some say that not even not going on the sun, but just like when you go to vacation, I don't know, in Croatia, you just go under the shadow and just be in the shadow and like you get enough sunlight. Yeah, because the sun um, reflect and you get it also uh, in the shadow. Yeah, so I want to know like how, what, how should I behave? Like a half an hour per week is the time, or the good time. Okay. Uh, from March to October because uh, from October to March, uh, there are not UVB in the sun in uh, our uh, country. Okay. You can go once in a week, uh, half hour, um, from 9 to 11 or past uh, 16, is the good time. Okay. Half hour, no, not no. Okay. <laughs> and also one other question. Like, what about the skin, like black or brown skin? How is it like we know there's less cancer less everything sunburns. How is it about skin aging? Does that also behave differently? Uh, in those studies, they, con uh, they, um, they take these uh, different types of, of skin as um, re skin reaction to the chronic sun exposure. We know that black, um, black skin of people, um, people with b black skin um, have more mel melatonin and are therefore more um, protected from the sun exposure, whereas white skin people tend to have more um, sunburns and of course they are more um, in a greater risk. But of those genetics, still the um, hair color was observed as the um, best connected to the uh, incidence. Uh, yeah, may I ask about this uh, Scandinavian study? Uh, you mentioned that uh, those people who were exposed to sun more had uh, fewer deaths. But were other factors like exercise also taken into account? Uh, no, so these people that um, had some um, um, 
So it was not only in malignant melanoma. This study was conducted uh, regarding all, all the cancers, regarding heart disease and cerebrovascular disease. So um, all deaths in these people that were moderately exposed uh, were reduced. And uh, no, no uh, not such factors were taken into account. Because only the deaths regarding three, these three diseases. Okay, because my idea would be that those people who got more sun exposure would probably get more exercise to, that would, which would lower the risk of uh, cardiovascular and yes, it's cerebrovascular. Yes, it is like disease. a chain, it is like a chain, that's healthy lifestyle, yes. When exposed to sun, you're more active, you probably have better diet. Okay, sure, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks. I have a question that is connected with vitamin D deficiency because we know it's not only, vitamin D is not only linked to the sun but also in an enzyme insufficiency and I have a question. How often do you check if these enzymes like in the liver and in the lungs is working? Actually in clinical practice, do no. you do this? No, we, we can uh, see only uh, the level of vitamin D. Uh -huh. I, in my praxis, I do it in other people with a lot of basilioma cell cancers or uh, squamous uh, cellular cancer. Uh, I do it and I find mostly a very low level. I live in Trieste, we have C, we, uh, the people go from March to November at the sea and some bad thing, but we have a lot of people uh, with a very low level of vitamin D. And you can take it uh, every week or uh, you, uh, we, we have a lot of pharmaceutical drugs with vitamin D and they uh, were good. But I explain you must go once in a week, a half an hour, it's better than, than one uh, vitamin D intake uh, per hour. Uh, I would ask a question. Is the uh, effect of, sun, of, of the sun equal to the effect of the uh, solarium? Uh, some, I think, or there are differences? We don't them? know. Uh, because uh, we can suppose that uh, the um, UV, uh, the infrared radiation maybe have some uh, health effects, but we don't know which is uh, the most important. But when you take uh, vitamin D per oil, you have uh, some very good uh, responsive in all the people you, um, in the two weeks ago, uh, an old man uh, uh, told me about how good feel it now with only vitamin, per oral vitamin D. Uh, it's not only uh, immunization, uh, immune, system, immune system, but uh, um, muscle pains, uh, uh, arthritic pains good better with uh, vitamin D. Any other question? Maybe I'll ask one more. <laughs> if I refer again to the solarium thing. Uh, isn't it that in solarium there, there is selective radiation, only the selective UV, UVs, no? They in the solarium, the most of uh, popular solarium have UVA radiation. And now in the United States, it's prohibited for um, teenagers go to uh, solarium. And I mean in uh, Great Britain and French, uh, it's prohibited without, uh, beyond the 18. Only the older can go. And it's right because in Finland they find that uh, um, the solarium increase the melanoma in young uh, women in the last 10 years. I mean. Yeah, but could we turn that into uh, our favor? I mean, the solarium. Uh, it's not good because solarium is uh, UVA, and you can have. Uh, could we change and use uh, UVBs only uh, or but UVB, solarium? UVB you 
can find only in medical uh, devices and uh, it's enough uh, three minutes of treatment uh, for uh, uh, vitamin D uh, production. And so uh, the tanning, tanning mm -hmm. it's not uh, a good effect. It's uh, a cosmetic effect, but for the health, it's not good. Thank you. I may have one more question. Uh, does the tanning itself, like the color, uh, prevent the good effects of sun? I don't know if I explained my thoughts. You know, yes. if you have darker skin, it doesn't you go make, uh, deeper? Yeah. Uh, when you are darker skin, you must be on sun a long, longer time to make the same uh, amount of vitamin D. Uh, the skin type, uh, we have uh, divided the skin types about uh, Fitzpatrick, uh, American dermatologist, divide the skin type in six uh, different types. The six is the darker, the, the brown, and uh, they can be on uh, 60 minutes uh, on sun uh, for the uh, same amount of vitamin D for in, in the uh, third type of uh, skin type uh, can be 10 minutes. It's different time for, the, for make the same amount of vitamin D. Thank I have much. one more question, oh, okay. if I can. Uh, in this half an hour time, we must be exposed uh, per week. How much skin must be exposed? Um, it's enough uh, arms and face. And um, in summer, when we are <laughs> almost naked, we have to take this into account and spend, I don't know, just 20 minutes or less? Yeah, maybe okay. it's enough. Thank we you. need more studies that uh, at that time it's, it's, uh, uh, there are the supposition it's not uh, sh sure, but maybe it's enough. So just, you say that actually going to the seaside, that is a bad habit, like that developed in our culture, seaside holidays, that it's unhealthy? Uh, no, I, I see... Uh, mm, Two weeks ago, a lady, they are going to Seychelles, and when it's coming back, uh, the vitamin D was uh, the best uh, in the, ten, the, the, the last 10 years, without any vitamin D per us. And a uh, um, colleague uh, told me that um, he saw a patient who was uh, wary in Afghanistan, and when come back in Italy, has a wonderful vitamin vitamin D. Before was six or something. So uh, it's uh, some bad thing in a tropical country for us. Uh, when it's made uh, in the right manner, it's very good for vitamin D. Okay. But uh, the problem is the right thing, not some burns, but only. Um, tanning not so dark. And with uh, um, Fitzpatrick 3, uh, Fitzpatrick <coughs> 1 type of uh, skin um, must be careful every day with uh, right creams, right uh, shirts, skirts, uh, the good uh, prevention of some birds, burns. No more question? Okay. Mine is the real, really the last one. Uh, for psoriasis and other uh, diseases, it is better to be like more than half an hour or it's the same, you know, for treating uh, psoriasis? Uh, psoriasis we treat in, uh, with medical devices all year and uh, we must avoid some burns. Uh, it's different uh, between skin types and everyone now which skin type is and how much uh, can be on sun without burning. But the half an hour, it's the same if you have or you do not have psoriasis? Uh, yeah, for vitamin, vitamin D. 
but for treatment of psoriasis, you must be a long time, longer time at sun, not in the wrong hours. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. I can say it was a successful session. Uh, thank you, Maya. Thank you, Maria. It was wonderful. And a big applause also for the mentor. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, we will now, now have a break of 10-15 minutes and then we will continue with orthopedics and today we will also vote for the best debaters so remember who convinced you like for his pro or counter side. Thank you.
We are now starting with the second session today, uh, orthopedics. I would like to uh, thank mentor Dr. Bras Maucic, who is sitting here next to me. And we are starting with the first debate, anterior cruciate ligament injury to reconstruct or not to reconstruct? That is the question. Pro side, Jan Stangel from Ljubljana, contra side, Lucas Bruno Lezende. Okay. Hello to everyone, uh, my name is Jan, and I'm going to argue about the uh, uh, pro site for surgery. And here is my colleague Lucas Bruno from uh, Brazil, and he's going to argue for the contra. Mm. So, um, I'm a fourth year medical student, sorry. I'm a fourth year medical student from Brazil, who currently, who's currently doing an exchange program in France. And that's how I come to get to know the Congress. So, um, we're we gonna start, Jan. Yeah, so we all have a rough idea how the knee looks like, uh, but let's keep in mind because the knee is not a spherical joint, so it needs anterior cruciate ligament to, prevert, uh, to prevent translation of tibia forwards, and al it also needs posterior cruciate ligament to prevent uh, translation of tibia backwards. Also, keep in mind uh, the anatomic position of hamstring muscles, uh, quadriceps muscle, and patellar tendo, as we are going to talk about it later on. Also, fun fact, strength of uh, anterior cruciate ligament is 2,160 newtons. That goes for the healthy ligament. And uh, on planet Earth, that equals to 216 kilograms. So, uh, <coughs> let us see how it all happens. And uh, to make things easier to understand, we've prepared a simple case report. And for all intended purposes, uh, let's call him Steve. Can we see the video clip, please? Yeah. So we, here we can see Steve running and uh, stopping and making a forced rotation in semi-flexed position of the knee. Now, what that happens is that stretches the anterior cruciate ligament uh, it overstretches it and uh, causes trauma. And here we can see Steve having a bad time. Bad time for Steve right there. Why is that so? Because he endured non-contact trauma. He uh, felt, maybe even heard, popping sensation in the knee. He immediately failed, felt uh, pain. Uh, his, uh, knees pro his knee probably gave way. Uh, later, swelling and maybe even he uh, hemarthrosis developed. Uh, that was one mechanism of injury. Uh, the other one uh, can be uh, contact or high energy trauma. And this is uh, often associated as well with uh, damage to medial meniscus and medial collateral ligament. Incidence in general population is about 1 to 3,500 and is actually more common in females. So, um, to, uh, what would the clinical picture of Steve look like when uh, he would come to the, uh, to the clinic? Um, to evaluate anterior uh, rupture of an arterial, anterior cruciate ligament, we have a couple of orthopedic tests available. And can we see a video clip again? Here we have an example of a Lachman test, um, which basically, similar to anterior drawer test, uh, measures the uh, movement of tibia in forward direction. It would be negative if, if it was less than three millimeters. Here we can see movement of over 10 millimeters, uh, which, can, which is quite reliable uh, clinical picture for anterior cruciate ligament rupture. We also have pivot shift test, but with some really, really high performing athletes, much better than Steve, they might have so strong uh, supporting muscles that we won't actually get, it, get uh, this clinical picture. So in those cases, maybe we, we should use uh, magnetic resonance imaging for final confirmation. So now I'm going to talk to you about what the concerning treatment is and how the rehab process goes. So basically, concerning treatment focuses on physiotherapy, and um, it's a really long process that may take up to six months, depending on your level of activity. And it's variable, it's variable from center to center. So for instance, if I rupture my ligament here in Ljubljana or in Brazil, and I undergo physiotherapy, the protocols might be a, dip, a bit different, but in the end, they have um, somewhat similar goals. And even if you opt only for doing physiotherapy, that is the concern treatment, or you opt to do 
um, surgery, you have to undergo the, the rehab process. It is, it's extremely important for recovering joint stability. So our main goals for this rehab process are to alleviate pain and prevent edema, that is joint swelling. We want to recover a normal articular range of motion of the knee, recover our muscle strength, and in that way, we want to improve joint stability. So let's see what Steve's been doing this last year. So probably in the first few weeks, um, Steve's been getting some partial weight discharge with crutches, as we can see here. And then he might have been, some, he might have been doing some uh, wall sliding exercises and some passive mobilization of his joint knee. And the goals in, on this stage are to prevent pain and edema. And we want to recover, uh, most importantly, full passive extension and um, 90 degree flexion but most importantly extension, and we want to emphasize normal gait pattern. We don't want the patient to limp. So fast forwarding a bit. Now three to four weeks, our goal for Steve is that his knee can now bear his full weight. So we want to try to discharge enough the crunches, and we want to increase our range of motion to up to 120 degrees in flexion. And for that, as an example, we have some biking exercises. So. Now then, from weeks 4 to 11, things start to get more, more interesting, and we start having, here you can see Steve, Steve is doing some hamstring machine exercises. That means that he's actually doing active movement against resistance. So his, it's really a more intense phase of recovery. And now from weeks 12 to 18, even more intense training, and we get those exercises in which you should exert full maximum um, Musculature strength in short bursts, as we can see in these jumping exercises. And our main goal is to strengthen both quadriceps anteriorly and hamstrings posteriorly. So in the final months, our goal is return to sport if you're an active sportsman. And here you can see Ronaldo, one of Steve's idols. He has undergone so, much, oh, has undergone so many hardships with his knee, but he came back. And here you can see he playing against some German guys. So our goal is to get full strength recovery and go back to sports. Yes, Ronaldo indeed benefited greatly for all the ex from all the exciting surgical treatment options we have av available. Uh, let's say the gold standard and the technique that's probably also the most suitable for Steve is patellar tendon graft, where a stripe of patellar ligament with uh, bone blocks from the both end is harvested and uh, insert it into a into, uh, drilled channel. Uh, good, good attributes of uh, this technique are that uh, the bone-to-bone -bone structure uh, gets fixated in much faster rate. Also, uh, between 12 to 18 weeks, uh, weeks post-surgery, uh, uh, patellar ligament can actually reheal itself. And some, in some cases, it was even uh, suitable to be reharvested again. That makes human body like ligament producing machine. However, it also has downsides. And the main downside is that the recovery can be quite painful. The incision uh, area is bigger. And a patient often, uh, a patients uh, often experienced tender, uh, tenderness in the knee. Other technique widely used is hamstring tendon graft, where a hamstring muscle, usually muscle semitendinosus, is harvested, cleaned off muscle tissue, folded, sewn together, and inserted into the canal. Uh, it's like, how does how's that even possible? And yet it is. However, it also has some negative sides. It weakens the hamstring group of muscles, and which doesn't reheal that well. So for let's say our Steve who needs to run backwards playing football, and for, let's say, ballet dancers, um, this technique is not optimal. We also have quadriceps tendon graft possibility. In some rare cases, we can even take a ligament from the cadaver. And nowadays, there is a really awesome uh, technological development in terms of, uh, in the field of synthetic prosthetics. Unfortunately, technology is not here yet, so still uh, the patellar tendon graft and hamstring tendon graft are the most widely used. So now that we got the full picture of how to diagnose and a bit on how to treat, now we come to the most important question, which treatment should you choose for your patient? 
And there, we have some inspira an, inspirational, an inspirational quote for you. Decision is more important than incision. So let's see what this is all about. Yeah, well, uh, one of the facts of uh, when making the decision is that uh, anterior cruciate ligament does not heal on its own, never. So the main indication to have surgi uh, surgical reconstruction is the need to fix instability of the knee. And the main contraindications reside in comorbidities. So for instance, severe arthrosis, defect in cartilage and meniscus. If you have those conditions, you might be better off getting a joint replacement. Oh, sorry. And now I'd like to ask Jan, since he's telling us about this instability of the knee, what is it all about? What is the instability of the knee joint? Instability is really easy to measure. We have seen the diagnosis si slide. We have orthopedics tests. We even have the arthrometer KT1000, which can m measure the difference between healthy uh, joint and damaged joint exactly in millimeters accurate. What's the f uh, what is the uh, damage done to anterior cruciate ligament? I see, but don't you think that even with all those fancy names, aren't you missing the big picture? Maybe what this is all about, it's function, not anatomy. So you need to take into account the subjective perception of the patient, how he sees the functional laser. So for instance, the patient's gonna come and he's gonna tell you, my knee's giving way. For him, the most important thing is to recover some stability and not to have the ligament itself. And we do know that by undergoing rehab, we can get that instability back even if it, we don't really have the ligament itself in place. So that's what you need to take into account. Yeah. Luckily, we have a mechanism to objectify this subjective perception uh, that patients uh, have. Uh, we do this by dividing uh, the patients into those four categories. Those are actually really, really uh, valuable and important categories um, from which we can estimate patients' needs and, uh, if, op if, and if the surgical treatment is really the best option for them. Uh, in which category do you think Steve falls into? First one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, this surgical thing, it seems all fine, but what if it goes wrong? And it actually goes wrong in one, out, in one out of 10 cases. So let's hear a bit about it. So how does it actually fail? Mostly it's related to surgeon skill. So it fails when you have problems with fixation, you have problems with autograph or allograft quality, impingement, and non-anatomic placement of the, of the tunnels. And a really strong point I'd like to emphasize in, uh, is unrestricted rehab. Rehab is really fundamental. And in that point, too, we have to take into account that sometimes the patient may come to his physician and say, my knee is still giving way. But he, the physician may come and say, no, but here, look at your arthroscopy. The KT1000 is telling us less than 3 millimeter, three millimeter displace, displacement. So, but even then, the patient will say, it's still unstable, but for the physician, it's stable. So you see, on the part of the physician, it's a success. On the part of the patient, it's a failure. So we might get some discrepancies. Yeah, unmeted expectations can be a problem. But all those failures you mentioned are basically down to operator error. And uh, yeah, OK, so maybe the general statistic might be 1 in 10 goes wrong. But actually, it varies greatly, not only from institution to institution, but from surgeon to surgeon. So I suppose that experienced surgeon uh, might alleviate possibility for most of those complications. Yeah, you're right, but we still get some uh, things that we can't really foresee. For instance, resistant organism infections. Septic arthritis is no joke, and the bacteria can really eat away your knee, and then you have nothing left. So even if you're the best surgeon, you follow all the protocols, you still get around 1% risk for septic arthritis, unfortunately. Yeah, septic arthritis might be, might be life-threatening condition. But let's also not forget that we can have complications by not taking a surgical treatment. Let's not forget about adhesions. Um, free particles of torn ligaments can adhere to structures in the knee and prevent the normal range of movement. We can have uh, pro production of ossifications, which not only do they cause pain, they can also um, damage adjacent structures. 
as I said before, our anterior cruciate ligament does not heal on its own, so the instability does not get better. Uh, it usually gets worse. And uh, with the defected knee, we have, in cases, non-physiological um, case of non-physiological uh, stress uh, to certain parts of cartilage, which can cause increased rate of uh, cartilage de uh, degeneration and arthrosis. Well, you do have a point with that, but I'd like to do a quick recap on everything you said. So, for instance, adhesions and ossifications, it comes pretty much down to individual level, individual susceptibility and everything. And the fact that we're doing passive and active mobilization, we're actually trying to avoid this. So, for instance, when you mobilize a joint, you're basically impeding that ossifications and adhesions, scar tissue retraction, and all that things, we're impeding that they occur. And so, it's really important. As for progressive instability, you have a point, if we do nothing, the instability might get worse, but what happens is that by strengthening our muscles, it makes for a tighter and closer joint, and it actually improves instability. So if you're following everything and you're doing things right, progressive instability is not a real deal. Stability is gonna get better, actually. And concerning increased rate of cartilage degeneration, you do have a point. We might get some bizarre and not so physiological stresses and biomechanics in the knee joint, but it's still pretty much on the theoretical side so yeah, we do know we might get some damage in the side, but regarding osteoarthritis and the degeneration of cartilage itself, we do not have some real studies, like long, long-term studies that can really say for sure you're gonna get earlier osteoarthritis just because you didn't really opt for the surgical treatment. Well, it might be still in the uh, phase of hypothesis, but you cannot argue with numbers. And now let's check what the cost-benefit uh, ratio of surgical treatment is. We measure the uh, cost-benefit ratio with quality-adjusted life years, which not only do they take into consideration the financial cost itself, they also take into consideration how, the, um, how much is it worth to the patient and uh, how much patient's life uh, has improved. Now, when you, th when you think about surgery, you would think that, oh my God, it's going to cost so much. Well, you'd be wrong, because actually, at least in Slovenia, the reconstruction of anterior cruciate ligament is really inexpensive. Uh, insurance company uh, pays around uh, 1,400 euros for the procedure, regardless if it's just a simple arthroscopy or a complicated reconstruction. So from taxpayer's point of view, it's really, really cost-effective procedure. Also, comparative study from Switzerland and Norway, uh, where they have almost six times uh, the cost of the surgical treatment as we do have in Slovenia, the cost-benefit ratio was still much, much in favor for the uh, surgical reconstruction. Even in the worst case scenario, there was still a positive outcome. Now, how would you argue about that? You know, if you're thinking from a public health perspective, insur uh, health insurance company perspective, you're right but you have to take things down to an individual level. So it's Steve who's sitting in front of you and not the general population. And we need to take those studies with a little grain of salt because the population we include in it, it's actually everybody. So we get all the four um, levels of activity for our patients. And so when it comes down to individual level, you need to think about that maybe. When you take everyone in, it's worth it. But what about the, um, let's take for instance the example of Maria. Maria actually tore her ligament when she was running to get the bus. She's 50 years old and she mostly watches TV and do some gardening on, on Sundays. So, of course, undergoing only rehab is cheaper than undergoing surgery and rehab. But what happens in those studies is that you get somewhat like 30, 20% complication rate in the concerted treatment and they, they add all that up. So in the end, it makes for concerted treatment being more expensive in terms of quality of life. So you need to take, um, my point is that those studies prove that we're actually not in the exact point of selecting really reliable 
the patient that should undergo each treatment because you get those high complication rates and increase the costs. Yeah, and uh, actually, as you mentioned before, we really must tailor every decision uh, from case to case. There is no universal uh, decision. And it's also always a multifactorial decision where we have to take also into consideration when to operate. Uh, should we operate immediately after the trauma happens or only when the post-traumatic reaction subsides or maybe half, uh, half a year later or five years later? Time is important here. Yep. And then regarding the patient's age, age itself is not, is not the most important thing, but in general population get an idea that age relates to sports level and expect, expectations and everything, and so that's what you should take into account when doing it, the actual activity level. Thanks for bringing up activity level, because activity is usually connected with expectations. And for someone who has expectations like Steve, for him it's crucial that he can return to his profession, which is a football player, as soon as possible. Whereas Maria, who, is more, who has a more couch potato kind of lifestyle, uh, she does office job with no physical activity needed. She might not have even been bothered by not having a uh, fully, fully functional anterior cruciate ligament. So uh, we really should always take um, patients' expectations and their subjective perception of uh, the trauma in mind. And finally, what's the patient's motivation? Is he really will, willing to undergo surgery when you explain to him, oh, but we're just going to drill two holes on your knee and then we're passing this? strings and everything, there are people who really don't want like no way to undergo surgery and you do have to talk to them about that. Yeah, but we still haven't addressed the cases where, for example, urgent arthroscopy is indicated. Uh, arthroscopy itself brings most of, the, uh, most of the risks of the surgery itself and sometimes it's definitely indicated, um, such as in cases of uh, locked in knee or when uh, severe hemorrhosis developed. So the question is, should in those cases, once we are there, also do the reconstruction? It's uh, uh, also one way to, uh, one thing to discuss about. Mm -hmm. And now we're coming to a closing point. So what we should take, what, what we should keep in mind, ACL rupture is not a life-threatening condition. So the patient actually has some time to reflect upon what, what, he, what he's feeling. So you get to factor in his subjective perception of the instability of his knee, and you also get to factor in like the Lachman test, all the complementary examination he's gonna get, and that's yeah. really important. It's not life-threatening condition, and uh, so that's why we don't have to, and not only that, we should not make decision for the patient. We must educate the patient and present, uh, present them with all the options. But in the, at the end of the day, they are the ones that are supposed to make the final decision uh, how they want their treatment to be and what are the outcomes and the consequences that they're prepared to live with. And with this, we are ending our presentation part, and now we are open for the debate. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much to both of you for this wonderful presentation. Are there any questions? Um, yes, uh, could you please explain uh, the point of this delayed operation? I don't understand um, you know, what the point of it is. And uh, if you think it's a good idea, how long should uh, the surgeons wait to operate? Uh, because I, I have a friend who's waiting on it, and um, the waiting list is two years, so is two years really a good time? In, in which country is that? Croatia. Uh, okay, uh, okay let, let me just say that in last Olympic Games in Sochi, there was a case of a Slovenian sportsman who got an injury of ACL, and um, two subspecialists were involved in this treatment. One of them said, let's wait at least three months so that this um, acute inflammation related to injury subsides, and then we will operate. However, the other surgeon somehow was more interested to perform the operation, not necessarily out of this medical reasons. Uh, and of course, the patient himself was psychologically, let's say, injured by this 
injury and wanted to come back as soon as possible. He wanted to find a solution as soon as possible. So in the end, he was operated two weeks later. Uh, but even subspecialists don't really agree which is the best. But however, it would be within three to six months, definitely, if you want to operate. Uh, I mean, two years will not do much harm, but in those two years, he will not be able to, let's say, do sports, uh, I mean, do serious sports. Okay, so the, I, yeah. thank you for your answer. I have a question, actually a tiny case report. Um, and I would like you to comment it as a specialist for the knee injuries. So I'm speaking about my cousin who is 18 years old. He is almost one met meter and 90 centimeters tall, has 100 kilograms and plays handball. And so he, has, he had a, a knee injury at the game and his knee got swollen over the night and very painful, could not walk, could not do anything. Next day, he went to the perif peripheral hospital here in Slovenia, in the west of the country. And what they did is they, uh, so the emergency surgeon inspected him. He was a urologist. And what he did was a knee punk, you know, the puncture. Mm -hmm. And he got some, almost one deciliter of blood out of his knee. But his knee was so painful that of course he did not do the Lachman test or any other knee tests. So, um, two days later, he got there again, and they did the puncture again, but no knee tests at all. Uh, now it's four weeks after the injury, and he still, not can, uh, he still can't flexure the knee. Uh, so after 10 days after the uh, injury, he only got the, how do you call it, the thing to put, to uh, improve the, to, opornica, so the... Mm -hmm. Brace. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, and that was all. How would you comment this approach? Is that the right approach okay. to a knee injury? Okay, uh, ideally he would get an MRI as soon as possible. Yeah. Okay, the, the urgency of this MRI depends on our um, clinical assessment of what really is wrong with this knee. But I, you know, he didn't even get like a physical knee exam. They were not thinking about MRI. It's difficult to really so. recommend kind of treatment if you don't know what's wrong with the knee. Yeah. yeah so but uh, generally, I would say an indication for immediate arthroscopy would be locked in knee. Yeah. Now, I, I, I don't know, I mean, in this case, if this is, the, I mean, locked in, it means unable to fully extend and unable to flex more than 90 degrees. But I have, we have seen cases where patients were referred to us as locked in knee and even had an MRI uh, sort of proving this uh, locked in knee, and in the end it was only torn ligaments. Torn ligaments which caused this painful reaction of not being able to. We then uh, immediately arthroscopy the knee, but only found torn ligaments, anterior cruciate ligament. Yeah. So, so would you recommend? I, I, I think that with every week that passes by, this assessment will be more correct. Because okay, so if like the problems persist in cases like that, you would recommend just going, referring to orthopedic surgeon? Yes, definitely. I, or, I, I mean, to subspecialists <laughs> for knee injuries, uh, okay, definitely, a traumatologist or orthopedic surgeon, to, to recommend what so. is the right thing to do right now. Uh, but uh, re possible reconstruction is the, the last thing on my mind. It's the, only the, it's the question of whether we should acutely uh, release some torn meniscus. This is the, the most urgent thing. Thank okay, you. thank you. Uh, any more questions? Otherwise, I would ask maybe a little provocative question. Um, is it better to uh, be inspected by an orthopedic or a uh, traumatologic uh, so specialist the, for uh, an injury? <laughs> I mean, there are traumatologists who are very skilled in uh, knee examinations and there are others who are not. And the same thing is, is with orthopedic surgeons. So really, I, I wouldn't really this limit this to some specialization. It's rather of, I mean, the person should be self-critical enough to know uh, how he can examine a knee. But I immediately after the injury, let's say the first three days or so, it's, it's very difficult to examine a knee properly. We, we, I remember one case when we didn't get any Lachman test. And, and then after we applied anesthesia, it was quite obvious it's, it's uh, laxative, but only after anesthesia. So it's, it's not a, it's difficult to examine. Yeah, I wouldn't be too critical. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions? Uh. 
I have a question for the conservative treatment. There are lots of those complementary supplements such as collagen and chondroitin sulfate and this stuff. Is this useful or is just a placebo effect, an analgesic effect? For, from the point of view of healing torn ligaments, it's completely useless. But they have, I mean, the effect of these supplements is to reduce symptoms of knee osteoarthritis, generally. And they have this proven effect of reducing symptoms. But so does paracetamol, so do, let's say, um, uh, exercises in warm water. Uh, so it's, 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 all this is, it, it doesn't have placebo effect. It has actual effect, but only symptomatic. It will not heal the cartilage, and it will definitely not heal the ligaments. Of course, we should know ACL is one of the ligaments that will not heal by itself. There are ligaments that can heal by themselves, like medial collateral ligament or posterior crucial ligament. So it really it depends on which ligament and how torn it is. So those supplements are uh, effective even when taken uh, per os? Yes. I mean, they are effective in a symptomatic kind of way. It means I have 100 people who take this, 100 people who don't. Those who took this will have less symptoms of osteoarthritis, less pain, less stiffness. Uh, but um, I mean, if we look at them two years later, the, the level of cartilage degeneration will be the same. It will not affect the course of the disease. This is, let's say, but we have many symptomatic treatments. Let's say if you get acute viral infection like dengue fever or, or even Ebola, uh, what will save your life is symptomatic treatment, it means hydration, uh, uh, oxygenation. Although we don't have this causative treatment, so symptomatic treatment doesn't need, doesn't mean it's it's stupid. It just means it's symptomatic. The patient should know what we're doing. But, uh, or let's say if you have a, acute sciatica, acute lumbar ischialgia, pa painkillers will save you to go through this painful process, but will not remove the this herniation itself. So don't underestimate symptomatic treatment. So uh, and you one said last question, and then we move on. Yeah. So you said that uh, they've been proven more effective than placebo. Yeah, in terms of reducing symptoms of osteoarthritis. Uh. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you to both the debaters. And now we move on to the next debate. So we have the debate, a medical student's choice, cemented or uncemented hip endoprosthesis. Uh, pro side, Peter Brumat, contra side, Urban Bruls, both from Ljubljana. <clears throat> one, two, one, two. Okay. Uh, okay. At this particular moment, my name isn't really important. So I won't start this presentation with my name is Urban Brulz and together with Peter Brumat we will discuss about total hip arthroplasty. Nah, -uh, it's too cliche. Instead of this, I have decided to give you, my audience, an opportunity to open our discussion. How we will do that? I have prepared three questions for all of you and each individual can answer simply just by raising hand. Okay? Let's go to the first question. How many of you have already heard about total hip arthroplasty? Okay, most of you. It's something I would expect from a person who studies medicine. So let's go to the question number two. Does anyone present here have a prosthetic hip? I'm glad no one has it and I hope no one will ever need it, okay? And before I begin with an introduction, there's one more thing uh, for us, maybe the most important thing, and it is how many of you are ready to listen to this presentation carefully? Okay, some of you are, some of you aren't, but what we too would like is that after next 20 minutes, everyone in this hall will understand which fixation should we use in different circumstances. So, let me begin with the introduction. In the 1960s, British orthopedic surgeon, 
Sir John Charlie laid down the foundations of total hip arthroplasty. The, this reconstructive surgery procedure became one of the most successful and cost-efficient operations in modern medicine. Just to imagine, here in Slovenia, every year more than 3,000 patients underwent primary total hip arthroplasty. This means more than eight inserted implants every day. Ladies and gentlemen, we talk here about the operation of a century. Peter, please continue. The main goals of hip replacement surgery are to alleviate pain and to restore mobility while providing excellent joint stability. Nowadays, the matter of interest definitely lies in the survivorship of endoprosthesis, which exceeds 95% with 15 years of follow-up. It is obvious that the success rate of this kind of reconstructive procedure is high, but there is always tendency for improvement. It is important for you to understand that there are several factors affecting the outcome of the surgery and the durability of components, such as design of implant, bearing surface, the expertise of the surgeon, patient activity level, bone quality, BMI, and last but not least, fixation type. So, Ban, please tell us something more about it. So, as we heard, fixation is just one drop in the ocean of factors which have impact on survivorship. Fixation can be either by embedding the implant into a cement which acts as a grounding material or just simply by fitting the implant closely to a bone bed. Uh, in, different parts of the world, pref the uh, in different parts of the world prefer different types of fixation. For example, in North America, surgeons usually use cementless fixation. On the other side of the ocean, in Northern Europe, Cemented implants are the first choice. The fact is that both operation techniques have advantages and disadvantages. Consequently, the optimal fixation method has always been a matter of argument. And this is exactly why we are here today, to ask ourselves this question. Which fixation can be considered superior? Would it be cemented or uncemented? First, let's take a closer look to cemented THA. Cemented fixation was first described by the German surgeon Demisteplas Gluck in 1891 in Berlin, but it was John Charney who later improved and popularized this new technique in the 1960s. Please keep in mind that cement is a grout, not a glue, thus stronger in compression but weaker in tension. As cement, polymetal metaacrylate is used. For optimal outcome, a uniform cement mantle of 2 to 4 millimeters must be assured. It is suitable for older or less active patients or patients with poor bone quality, such as patients with rheumatoid arthritis or osteoporosis. Fixation is achieved by mechanical interlock of cement and bone layer. And such type of fixation is a conclusive type of fixation and permits immediate weight bearing and early pain relief. And this is how it looks like on x-rays after implantation. You can see the cement just around the endoprosthesis. But how does contemporary cementing technique look like? First, a tabular cup and medullary canal are prepared with serial reaming, rasping, and pulsatile lav lavage to remove any foreign objects. Then, vacuum preparation of cement takes place in order to, to reduce its porosity meaning the air bubbles in between the cement and to increase its strength. By distal plugging the femoral canal, we prevent cement leakage. These measures also reduce the risk of cement failure. Then, antibiotic laden cement is inserted via cement loaded gun to improve stability because proper cement insertion improves stability. Femoral stem is then implanted and stem centralization maintains uniform cement mantle, therefore preventing cement cracks and early osteolysis. Finally, a sustained pressure is applied until cement hardens to ensure maximum mechanical interlock of bone and cement layer and for proper anchoring. So, on the other side of the scale, we have cementless fixation. The concept of this method was introduced in the 1970s. The goal was to eliminate cement as a fixation modality 
because it was considered to be a principal cause of pelvic osteolysis. Cementless, or with other words, biological fixation, uh, is based on osteointegration between trabecular bone and the bone implant. Uh, more details about this process we can see here. Contemporary implants are usually textured, which means porous coated, and this enhance the ingrowth of bone tissue, which result in reliable fixation. The most important thing for cementless fixation is immediate mechanical stability at the time of surgery. We can achieve that with so-called with so-called press fit technique. And for better understanding, we will go step by step and describe how this surgical technique looks like. Okay? At first, acetabulum and uh, femur are prepared with serial reaming to achieve desired implant size. Then, a slightly larger implant is wedged into position. We, called here, we, we talk here about approximately one micrometer larger implants. Then, both co components, acetabular and femoral, must fit endostal cavity as closely as possible. Why? Because bone won't grow across anything wider than 50 micrometers. At the end, initial stability is tested, and if any motion is present, additional fixation with screws is necessary. Briefly, that would be all about surgical technique. And there's only one more thing. Which patient should undergo this fixation method? At first, of course, young and active patients, then older patients with good bone stock, and finally, people who need a revision surgery. By now, you must have understood the basic or general idea behind both methods. Hence, we will now discuss pros and cons behind each fixation type. So, the advantages of cemented fixation are manifold. However, these are the most important ones. One, by cementing, we can achieve better long-term outcome due to independent act prosthesis axis alignment and a stable cap position when implanting, thus contributing to diminished component wear and diminished osteolysis. Cemented endoprosthesis has statistically shown lower complication rate in first five years after implantation, meaning less luxations and less fractures. Two, Cemented fixation provides an immediate post-operative advantage in terms of better osteointegration, which results in immediate weight bearing and early pain relief. Such type of fixation is a conclusive type of fixa fixation, and we don't need to wait for the bone in growth. And how do we see this in real life? Elderly and previously disabled patients can walk around shortly after implantation. And number three, since our economy is money-driven, one should not forget the fact that the price of cemented endoprosthesis is approximately 300 euros lower than the price of the cementless one. Everything what Peter said is correct, but this fixation method has also uh, disadvantages. The first and the predominant disadvantage is that it's very difficult to revise the implant af after it wears out. This is the main reason why it's not recommended for young persons. Then, in comparison with the biological fixation, uh, cemented components require more operative time. And as we know, nowadays time is money. Number three and four, higher loading stress may cause cement cracks over time. And if operation is not performed correctly, the cement mantle can be distributed uneven. And such lesions may lead to an early prosthesis failure. And because of these reasons, many surgeons rather prefer cementless fixation. And as I said, it is 15 to 20 minutes operation, shorter uh, operation time, and then it's easier to revise the implant after it, after it wears out. And finally, the biological fixation over time will profit from stresses imposed to the border between implant and the bone. Nevertheless, several precautions should be considered when choosing a cementless fixation. Number one, osteolysis is the major obstacle to long-term cementless acetabular component survival. The difficulty of achieving proper axis alignment and acetabular cap fixation at the same time contribute to greater osteolysis and previously the greater 
uh, component were. Iatrogenic fractures due to under-rimming the femur when implanting and tie pain due to stiffness mismatch between bone and cementless center prosthesis layer occur more frequently in uncemented stems. Atrophy of the proximal femur is substantially greater because of uh, bone unloading, the greater portion of the force bypasses proximal femoral bone and goes straight through the endoprosthesis, which results in reduced proximal femoral bone density. This is so-called phenomena femoral stress shielding. And four, when dealing with patients with poor bone quality, it is dis difficult to achieve proper osteointegration integration without using cement for anchoring. So, here we are, conclusions. Most of the reported studies that we have analyzed show the slight preference of a cemented fixation. This was mostly due to a better short-term outcome and early pain relief. Revision-free 10-year survival of a cementless THA was lower than that of a cemented, and this was mainly due to a poor performance of cementless acetabular component. On the other hand, some articles recommend cementless fixation, speaking in the favor of younger and more active patients. However, ongoing critical review to 20 years and beyond is required because the advantages are only seen at long-term follow-ups. However, whether it's best to implant proven reliable components or keep inventing new ones is still open to debate. The future of THA lies in developing articular surfaces to diminish component wear osteolysis, and further investigation of component loosening. An improvement may be achieved by reducing component wear debris through different bearing surfaces, such as improved cross-link polyethylene, metal on metal articulation, ceramic on ceramic articulation, and also by increasing the percentage of bone in growth into the acetabular cup by the use of new era materials, such as the tantalum, or by the use of growth factors, such as OP-1. In the last 20 minutes, we showed you the basic idea, the pros and cons behind each fixation type. Yet, when you're one of the best and you strive for perfection on an everyday basis, like our mentor, Professor Dr. Mauchi does, then you should choose an established cemented or cementous component based on individual patient characteristics, knowledge, preference and the level of your expertise. So we started out with John Charney and his remarkable contribution. And before I conclude, I would just like to add one thing. Even though we all like football, Mr. Charney, after more than 50 years, we still haven't proved you wrong. So thank you on behalf of my colleague Urban and myself. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, both, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, are there any questions? Sarah. Actually, there is a question behind <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah. Do you ever have an example when, uh, when the patient uh, actually chooses uh, whether he wants to have cementless or cemented prothesis. Yeah, we, I mean, it's particularly, uh, I mean, there are, as you know, there are certain types of patients who are problematic. Uh, they're like the teachers and engineers, generally. Uh, they say, teacher, <laughs> it's not a profession, it's a diagnosis. <laughs> so uh, this, kind of, uh, this kind of patients would ask these questions. And of course, it's, um, I mean, it's in our best interest to explain this to them. Uh, but basically, if, if in previous uh, topic we had the, the conclusion that the, the, the patients should take the final choice, here I think the surgeon should take the final choice. Uh, however, there is a problem of, um, it's also a political debate or financial debate of uh, why should we use more expensive prosthesis, why not cheaper? Uh, this is, it has been, a, it will be in the future an ongoing uh, debate. Uh, of how, how cheap prosthesis can we still implant to be on the safe side, uh, and uh, we should justify the use of uh, every single implant in every specific patient. Yeah. There was also, just to, to, to conclude, uh, there was a, a case of uh, bad prosthesis that broke 
uh, after a few years. Uh, we immediately stopped doing them after this international warnings came about. But then two years later, uh, I mean, after we have long stopped implanting them, we had the first breakage. Now the patient is suing, uh, not the hospital, but the, the, the I mean, the, the manufacturer. Okay, so this is always also an important aspect. Okay, so generally, yeah, patients do have questions, but I think basically the the the, the one who operates, I mean, they should trust they should trust the, the 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 surgeon will use the best thing he has for their particular solution. Uh, we have one more question. Okay, um, yeah. I I am a woman. I suspect, I assume that if I will ever need a hip prothesis, uh, will be because I'll have osteoporosis, so I'll be old. And let's say in 50 years, it will be still actual uh, if it, I will need uh, cemented or uncemented, because Peter uh, spoke about new technologies and new materials, but I'm like thinking about myself and everyone in the room. It will be like after 100 years after they Firstly, talk about it. It will be actual. Like they will it's, talk I mean, about it. Uh, it's interesting that in the last 40 years, uh, the technology has improved a lot when it comes to wearing of the sliding surfaces. But the technology of fixation into the bone has not really changed much. Uh, so both options are still used. Uh, and I think in in hip arthroplasty, perhaps in the next 50 years, we we don't see any real. Real, real revolutionary change, yeah. Unless, I mean, the, the person who will invent uh, the treatment of osteoarthritis in itself will truly gain 10 Nobel Prizes, but I wonder if this will be in 50 years or 500 years. Uh, I'd really <laughs> like to know. I hope we get to, when we come to heaven, we, we get to know this knowledge which we don't have now. <laughs> okay, so thank you again for the very useful debate because I will need it in 50 years. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, I would ask uh, just one more question. What about uh, if it comes to iatrogenic fracture? How do you solve it? Do you proceed with the uh, endoprothesis implant or? It's okay. Arthroplasty, periprosthetic fracture is always a big problem, both for patient and surgeon. Uh, generally, I mean, the general uh, treatment depends on whether the this fracture is such that prosthesis is still implanted into the bone or it's, it is such that the, the fixation of prosthesis is compromised. Mm -hmm. Then you proceed with different types. Uh, uh, but generally, generally, you have to put in longer prosthesis that fixates distally. <coughs> Just depending on how strong the bone is, then you use cement or not. Thank you. Uh, and any other questions? Otherwise, I would like to uh, congratulate with both of you for the wonderful presentation. I would like to th thank you and thank Dr. Majic for being here. Uh, now we will have a short break and then we will keep going with the next session. Ten minutes break. Thank you.
to have a dental medical session at our Medical Student Journal Club. However, we are quite unhappy that um, no dental students are here today except for Jona Bombic and Mitya Plut, who are studi uh, students of Medical Faculty of Ljubljana and will present us the topic of focal infection theory and they're gonna argue on the theme of all non vital teeth should be extracted or not. So, please. Hi, everyone. Hello. I'm Mitya. And I'm Iona. So, we are both students of dental medicine at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Ljubljana. And today, we are very glad to be a part of Project Contra Congress uh, as active participants and to present you a very special and interesting topic, focal infection theory. And this is the eighth session of the Congress. So as future dentists, we realize the importance of oral health on general health, and I hope and I think that you all agree on that. Together with our patients, we aim at good oral hygiene and fight against two widely spread chronic mouth diseases caries and periodontal disease. As caries progresses towards pulp, pulp may become inflamed and eventually die, leaving a dead, non-vital tooth shell behind. So we take care of this inflamed and infected teeth, we try to replace lost teeth, and to maintain teeth and its surrounding teeth and uh, surrounding tissues in a stable, healthy condition we perform follow-up examinations. To a practitioner, healthy and happy patient means that his work paid off. So, Mitya, what about that non-vital teeth? Should they stay or remain in patient's oral cavity? What does focal infection theory say? Uh, focal infection theory is an old theory continuously gaining and losing its popularity among medical professionals and public. It's a subject of controversy. Focal infection is localized or generalized infection caused by the dissemination of microorganisms or toxic products from a focus of infections. Uh, these microorganisms are not only bacteria but also uh, fungi and viruses. It's important to define the cause of focal infection. The focus of infection is a confined area that contains pathogenic Microorganisms can occur anywhere in the body and usually causes no clinical manifestation, no symptoms. This might lead to overlooking the existence of a focus. So, how does infection spread from a focus? Theory explains the pathogenesis of focal infection by four different mechanisms. Microorganisms or the toxic products may get entry to the deeper tissues by direct spreading through mucosas bone cavities, fascias, blood and lymph vessels, and even nerves. Then we have tissue damaging immunologic reactions and antigenic mimicry. This is when microbial antigens similar to host antigens induce an immune response that damages host tissue. As you can see, there are many foci of infection. Or most common are oral cavity, tonsils, adenoids, sinuses, gut, and less common are appendix, prostate, gallbladder, and kidneys. non vital teeth has always been, have always been assumed to be the main cause of focal infection. Basic concepts of focal infection theory are that countless diseases arise from a focus of infection. And which are the examples? The examples are arthritis, neuritis, myalgias, osteomyelitis, conjunctivitis, pneumonia, pericarditis, and nephritis. And also Alzheimer's disease, cancer, sarcoidosis, sclerosis, etc. And which focal infections are three most documented, publicized, and why? Most three documented are bacterial endocarditis, mostly in mitral and aortic valves. Eight to 30% of all cases are caused by dental procedures or diseases. Then we have brain abscess, most commonly frontal and temporal lobes. Less than 1% of all cases is caused by dental procedures or other diseases. And in the end, we have an orthopedic prosthetic joint infections. So, K 
cannot it be a focus of infection? Of course, bad teeth are a foci of infection. That is true, but what do you mean by bad teeth? By bad teeth, I mean carious teeth, this is, you can see here, that teeth with apical granuloma and teeth with advanced marginal periodontitis. To understand why can be a focus, uh, why can be a tooth a focus on infection, we have to differ between non vital tooth and vital tooth. Here we have the um, longitudinal section of a healthy tooth. Anatomically, we divide tooth in three parts crown, neck, and roots. With its surrounding bone, tooth is a vital structure formed of heart tissues, enamel, dentin, and cement. And a pulp chamber with root canals, blood vessels, nerves, fibers, and cells. The periodontium is the supporting structure of a tooth. You see here. Helping to attach the tooth to surrounding tissues. It allows sensation of touch and pressure. Periodontium consists of four components. First, we have cement. Then we have periodontal ligament. It's a specialized that surrounds the roots of tooth to provide support and creates a valus or socket. On the other side, we have a diseased tooth. Um, Dental caries, also known as tooth decay, uh, is a breakdown of tooth due to, activities, uh, due to activities of bacteria. They break down the hard tissues of a tooth by masking acids from a fruit, uh, food debris on tooth surfaces. C caries progresses first through enamel. Then microorganisms continue to the uh, periodontal tubus and go directly to the pulp chamber. Their toxic products engage inflammation in pulp long time before the carious lesion reaches it. Infected, inflamed pulp becomes necrotic, see here, and this is an attractant for microorganisms. Microorganisms organize themselves into biofilms. This way they are more resistant in their, uh, or more resistant than in planktonic form. In infected root canals, uh, microbial biofilms form on root canal surfaces in lateral canals, isthmuses, and dental tubules. Those bacteria produce toxins, which represent a stimulus for periapical tissues to produce inflammatory repos response. In most cases, up to 90%, this response is symptomatic. No clinical manifestation means the focus is easily overlooked. So the immune response you were talking about is apical periodontitis. This is an inflammation at the periapex caused by irritants, persistent microorganisms living in the root canal system of the affected tooth. It represents a defensive response to an infection of a necrotic pulp and prevents dissemination of microorganisms from root canal. In most cases, Infection is in balance with host immunity, so this is a dynamic balance between microorganisms and host immunity. Apical periodontitis emerges in two forms, asymptomatic in 80 to 90 percent and symptomatic in 10 to 20 percent. The examples for asymptomatic are granuloma in cyst and symptomatic acute apical periodontitis, abscess, and sinus tract as seen here, fistula. Well, what happens when immune response complies and infection spreads? We can see here a periapical lesion, which is usually sterile. But if microorganisms <coughs> detach from the uh, surface of biofilms, the, uh, they continue to colonize colonization of the other sites. If they exit through the apical foramen, the periapical lesion could become infected. This direct spread of bacteria leads to extraradicular extra infection and chance of bacteremia. Uh, 
uh, the presence of bacteremia in blood is always abnormal. Okay, but think, how possible is spontaneous bacteremia from a periapical endodontic lesion? The, pres the presence of bacteria in blood, so bacteremia, does not per se define an active infectious process. And there is no evidence showing that bacteremia spontaneously arises from infected root canals associated with chronic periapical lesion and causing systemic disease, and nor is there any study with acute abscess. Really, evidence exists. In 400 before Christ, the first known report of focal infection has been ascribed to Hippocrates. He cured a patient of arthritis after a tooth extraction. In 1800s, Dr. Benjamin Rush did the same. In 1920s, Dr. Weston Price republished a series of, series of rapid experiments and case reports of remarkable improvements in various medical condi conditions after tooth extraction. He stated that practically all non-vital teeth should be extracted. But these reports are old more than a century. So they're probably true. <laughs> but these are only partial studies. We call it pseudo studies. These were mostly animal experiments and doses, used, doses of microorganisms used to induce disease were too high to conclude that results could be the same in human. Well, this seem convincing to me. So you're saying that dentists and endodontists are criminals? What about it with advanced marginal periodontitis, pericarnitis, and impacted teeth? They all present a foci of infection. The claim that non-vital tooth causes bacteremia does not recognize a basic microbiological principle. We call it inoculum effect. This is the threshold level of bacteria necessary to produce an infection. There are conditions which bacteria have to achieve to induce disease, and these are. Bacteria must survive host defenses in blood vessels, as well as in distant body site, encounter predisposing conditions in distant body site for their attachment and further colonization, reach sufficient numbers to induce disease, and possess an area of virulence factors that can inflict direct or indirect damage to the host tissues. But still, bacteremia can arise and induce diseases. The occurrence of focal infection is rare and is incorporated in causal links. These are links between oral disease and disorders in remote parts of the body. These mentioned links show us why focal infection theory fails to pass scientific scrutiny. So microorganisms associated with the medical disorder should and must be the same as suspected oral microorganism. The onset of medical disease should follow the onset of the oral disease. And in cases where dental procedure is suspected to cause bacteremia, the onset of the medical disease should be within the incubation period. So, how to recognize a non-vital tooth? Non-vital teeth are mostly asymptomatic, as said before. We take a proper dental history from a patient and perform various diagnostic tests, like probing, percussion, palpation, vitality testing, like thermal cold test or electrical test, or mobility testing. We should be aware that all of these tests are to some extent unreliable, and this happens due to sensitivity and specificity of these tests, which may lead to false positive or false negative results and misdiagnose. Yona, does sensitivity mean vitality? Well, usually it does, but for testing vitality, we should measure blood flow through the pulp, but these methods are not in clinical practice yet. Uh, making radio radiographic exam is essential, panoramic and periapical. Yes, but we know that apical periodontitis is not always seen on those two. Then we help ourselves also with cone beam CT or MRI. And if you're still not sure, histology and microbiology are the ones 
are looking for. I agree with you that this letter too would be the only 100% reliable diagnostic methods, but they are not feasible. We would have to extract this non-vital tooth to check for periapical tissues. So, are you aware of how many people have non-vital teeth in their yes. oral cavity? <laughs> yes, a lot. <laughs> the, prevalence, the prevalence of apical periodontitis among 35 to 45 year old patients is 30 to 40 percent, and in, it's increasing in, with increasing age. So, if we decide to extract all non-vital teeth, many of us would soon be toothless. And what about presence of endodontically treated non-vital teeth? What about keeping them in oral cavity? There is a cure for non-vital teeth. And this cure is doctrinary and is called endodontic treatment or root canal therapy. So the aims of endodontic treatment are gaining access to the infection in the root canal through the crown and to uh, eliminate the infection to prevent or cure apical periodontitis. And we reach the infection by means of cleaning and shaping the root canal space mechanically, irrigating and disinfecting root canal space chemically, and hermetically obturating root canal space apically and coronary. So with this chemomechanical instrumentation of root canals, we minimize the effect of infection and removing the microorganisms from the root canal, filling the root canal hermetically and assuring a tight coronal seal are key factors for our success. Endodontic, so endodontic treatment is designed to eliminate bacteria, to prevent reinfection and to help us keep a natural tooth for a lifetime. Uh, because of complex of uh, root canal system anatomy, we cannot clean the whole canal system. So endodontically treated teeth are always infected. In base case of chemomechanical instrumentation of root canals, dentists clean up to 75% of root canal surfaces. Also, uh, in, it may be impossible to fill all lateral and accessory canals or eliminate the biofilms on the root canal walls. This goes also for extra infection. So after performing an appropriate endodontic treatment, residual microorganisms are entombed in the root canal space, deprived of nutrients by hermetic seal, and this hermetic seal is apically and coronary. There is no evidence to support the theory that the endodontic treatment is not safe and effective. Treated teeth being infected leads, leads to a risk of bacteremia. Spontaneous, still possible, or during treatment procedures of infected root canals or apical surgery. But there are also no valid scientific evidence that link root canal treated teeth and disease elsewhere in the body. There is no doubt Bacteria occurs during dental treatment procedures to cure non-vital teeth due to placing a rubber dam clamp, as we can see here, placing matrix band and wedges in this picture, or performing instrumentation within the root canal or beyond the apex. We have many ways to, to determine the working length, which is important for avoiding over-instrumentation. Whether instrumentation has occurred beyond the apex may not be readily determined, but there is apical extrusion of debris with inst all instrumentation techniques. So, if I understand, you are suggesting antibiotic prophylaxis for every dental procedure that well. is connected <laughs> with endodontic treatment. Well, what about daily oral hygiene measures and mastication? Bacteria are present in our oral cavities at all times. Well, antibiotic, antibiotic prophylaxis is an, it's another topic and it could be discussed further. So please, let's go back to endodontic treatment. Okay, I agree. The success of endodontic treatment differs in cases 
uh, whether we treat vital or non-vital teeth. With vital teeth, it is up to 96%. With non-vital teeth, without apical periodontitis, it is 80 to 90%. And non-vital teeth with apical periodontitis, 75%. The crucial for the success is hermetic coronal seal, as seen here. And it should be created under aseptic conditions as soon as possible, so in the shortest time after appropriate endodontic treatment was performed to avoid reinfection. But what if coronal seal fails? That is why we perform follow-up examinations. But defective or no coronal seal leads to reinfection of treated tooth. As you said before, endodontic treatment is not 100 successful. It can, it can fail due to four conditions. First, residual micro microorganisms are present in root canals <coughs> and dentinal tubules. After endodontic treatment, due to anatomical complexity of root canals, like deltas, isthmuses, obliterated canals and due to procedural errors like missed canals, ledges, zips, perforations or instrument fractures. Then we have second condition, reinfection. If a root canal filling is exposed to oral environment, leakage of microorganisms occurs within a few days. This leads to reinfection of a filled tooth. Third condition is extra-radicular infection. Bacterial clusters within the tissue, as well as bacterial biofilms on the external wall structure, may persist after endodontic treatment, even though the inflammation, the root canal infection has been eliminated. Same goes for cyst. So if practitioner is not successful the first time, he should try with retreatment or apical surgery. The success of retreatment, so the success rate is up to 60%, and apical surgery up to 50%. And the last resort before extraction is root amputation or hemisection. So, should we extract? And which tooth should we extract? Uh, pulpless teeth, carious teeth, badly treated teeth, all root filled teeth, only teeth with apical periodontitis, only necrotic or dead teeth without apical periodontitis, or should we extract all teeth? Well, some affected teeth have hopeless prognosis, and we are forced to extract them. OK, we extract. <laughs> what about bacteremia after extraction? When we extract, we use, we use an antibiotic prophylaxis. But we are all aware that wound healing lasts a few days and we cannot applicate it for the whole time of treatment. How long extraction site produce uh, bacteremias during the healing phase is still not known because no researchers studies were made to discover this risk. Okay, but I can tell you that bacteremia after endodontic treatment lasts only for about 10 minutes. So, we extract it, and what happens next? Does no tooth mean absence of problems? To practitioners and patients, tooth extraction has been generally the last resort of treatment. And why? Because once we extract a tooth, there is no way back, and there is no adequate replacement for a natural tooth. And as I said before, endodontic treatment allows patients to keep their natural tooth for a lifetime. What about prosthetic replacement? Prosthetic replacement helps us to minimize the negative effects of a missing tooth, but it always represents a retention site for microorganisms. And in patients with poor oral hygiene, this consequently leads to caries and periodontal disease. And as we've seen before, it can be a new focus of infection because of that. What about an implant? An implant is as close an approximation to a natural tooth as possible to achieve. 
Uh, it differs most significantly from a natural tooth by its lack of periodontal ligament, which means the absence of proprioception and that there is a lack of regeneration. Can an implant be a focus of infection? So peri-implant tissues are subject to mechanisms similar to periodontal disease, and it has been shown that periodontal sites are more difficult to keep clean than a natural tooth. We should be aware that nearly 18% of all implants require some type of post-treatment intervention. So, are implantologists criminals too? Implant success rates range from 95 to 99%. I would like to mention only two main and very important differences following this success rate, that implant studies generally report the procedures that were completed by specialists, while endodontic studies involve, involve work performed mostly by students and general dentists. And the other one, good oral hygiene, means that implants tend to be placed in the context of good oral health, whereas endodontic treatment is usually performed in the presence of active disease. So, to sum up, there is no adequate replacement for a natural tooth and it should be saved whenever possible. Iona, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> We would like to thank all of you for your attention. And at the end, we would like to thank our mentor, Maya Groschel, for all the support and instructions she gave us for guiding us through making this presentation. And now we are inviting her to present a professional view on focal infection theory in Slovenia. Thank you, Jona. Thank you, Mitya. Hello, everybody. Since Jona and Mita have been very thorough, I think, and picturesque, um, I will try to be short and systematic. I would like to show you basically how alive and how vivid the focal infection theory is in Slovenia nowadays, and to present you the protocol for dental foci elimination at the dental clinic where I work, and it's a part of University Medical Center in Ljubljana. Uh, to start with, we can say that focal infection theory is in Slovenia is uh, still alive and quite, uh, quite vivid. And that means it's vivid among physicians and among dentists. That's uh, among general dental practitioners as well as uh, different dental medicine specialists. And we can say that it's well known and vivid among patients and general public too. In Slovenia nowadays, we still have some dentists preaching and practicing focal infection theory like it was practiced 100 years ago. And that's not, not uh, only at their dental offices, but also on national TV and in various health magazines. What is good about that is that um, they basically educate general public but unfortunately, they also produce frightened patients running from dentist to dentist and finally to the dental clinic. Among patients, we have some cases when patients refuse extracting the suspicious, suspicious teeth we were talking about before. And on the contrary, we also have some cases when patients resist uh, endodontically treating teeth and insists on extracting all non-vital teeth. So let's look how this is in Slovenia, why patients are referred for dental foci elimination before, uh, before different medical procedures. They are referred before heart surgery, orthopedic surgery, organ transplantation, bisphosphonate therapy, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and bio, uh, biological drugs therapies. They are also referred for dermatological problems, mostly like alopecia, um, erythema, and urticaria. 
they are referred for ophthalmological problems because of having brain abscess, endocarditis, pneumonia, dysitis, uh, all fevers of unknown origin, uh, sometimes because of atypical facial pain and sometimes also because of headaches. In Slovenia, before even, even being put on the transplantation waiting list, the patient has to be fo dental foci free. So why dental foci eliminations? Physicians are basically afraid of bacteremia, as we were talking about, but also osteoradionecrosis, bisphosphonate necrosis, and especially compromised immunity. General dental practitioners in Slovenia prefer referring patients to the dental clinics because um, they are afraid of responsibility that um, definite dental foci identification brings. What's the protocol? Our guidelines are that we have to take a proper and extensive thorough medical and dental history first and after that we perform a thorough clinical examination which means that we do inspection and probing for dental caries or restorative uh, work for the defective margins, leakage. We uh, inspect the periodontal health, we test percussion, palpation, uh, mobility testing and vitality testing to find all, all bad teeth, non-vital teeth and periodontally diseased teeth. At the end, we always perform uh, radiographical examinations with panoramic and periapical um, RTGs. And uh, after that, we make always an individual treatment plan. We plan it together with the patients and with the physicians. The individual treatment plan is based on patient's condition uh, at the time of referral and on all the future predictions, but mostly on the time we have available. We plan for all the extractions, endodontic treatments, periodontal treatments and prostodontic treatments. And we also discuss antibiotic prophylaxis and uh, any changes that have to be made in anticoagulation or anti-aggregation therapy. Motivation for good oral hygiene is mandatory as a regu regular checkups for maintenance of good oral, oral hygiene. So there we come back to the beginning of our debate where we can, I think, all agree now that good oral health is um, a prerequisite for good systemic health. So thank you all for the attention. And for those of you who are interested in learning something more about endodontics or um, root canal therapy, there is a nice endodontic <laughs> comics in the lobby still, <laughs> which I have been a part of a little bit. And I think it's um, very picturesque, picturesque also for those of you who are not Slovene because I think that uh, even without the, the text, pictures says it all. So thank you again. So thank you very much, Jona and Mitya, for your very nice and very well prepared presentation. Uh, and thank you for being brave enough to uh, start our cooperation with dental medicine student. And of course, thank you. Um, uh, for being the mentor of this debate and for being also brave enough for being the first dental medical practitioner to join uh, our family of journal clubs. Um, yeah, and as we saw in your presentation that you prepared, actually a lot of our topics of this weekend are connected also to the problem of uh, focal infections in our oral cavities. So we are really glad that we involved this topic into our program this year. Are there any questions from the audience? <coughs> yeah.
Yeah, I have one question. Uh, actually, during uh, my clinical classes, I had a patient with endocarditis, and um, he was also a candidate for uh, aortic valve replacement, and he also had he had four teeth, so four teeth and <laughs> periodontitis, uh, older fragile, a fragile male. Um, and of course, for the aortic valve uh, replacement, he would need to ex get all four teeth extracted. But do you think that even before uh, the, the surgery, so during the actual therapy for endocarditis, would it make sense to extract his four remaining teeth? Or what, what dental procedures would be, um, would be viable to do? while he was treated only for the endocarditis. Would you like to answer the questions? No? I think no. it's too tough. Uh, was this patient already on uh, the antibiotic therapy? Yeah, on, on very heavy antibiotic therapy, yes. yes. I think that it would be uh, the safe time to extract all the teeth under the antibiotic prophylaxis. And uh, did, you, did you know which uh, microorganisms were um, contaminating the heart valves? We made that, but I forgot which bacteria exactly were, were present. Uh -huh. Have you linked, even in, in your mind, the, the endocarditis with those bad teeth or with something else? Well, we made an uh, antibiogram, uh, we, made, uh, we, we took um, hematocultures as well as um, urine cultures and adjusted the, the antibiotic treatment for those, but we did not take any, anti, anti, any microbiological sample from the teeth. Uh, and what were these antibiotics? I, were they uh, from the penicillin group? I think they, they were, yeah. Yes, if the patient is all already under the therapy with amoxicillin, basically, uh, then this would be the right time to extract all these four teeth uh, and to take all the um, precautions like um, uh, suturing the, the wounds after the extraction and then maintaining the um, the the antibiotic therapy the whole time that uh, the uh, extraction wounds uh, need to heal. So uh, the patient would benefit with uh, um, his situation of endocarditis, he would benefit by, tra by having his teeth extracted? Yes, uh -huh. okay. yes. We have to be, um, if these teeth were hopeless teeth, then it would the patient would benefit for, from the extraction, but um, were they, um, these teeth um, periodontally diseased or endodontically? He said periodontically. You said periodontically? Yes. Yes. Actually, it was a department for cardiology in periphery of Slovenia, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. who knows what he had. <laughs> no, that's... Um, that's a, a good sign <laughs> that uh, dentists and uh, physicians have to cooperate more. <laughs> yeah. I hope I answered your question. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, yeah, okay. uh, do you think that uh, family doctors and dermatologists and all the uh, other physicians that were listed uh, are aware enough about the danger of dental problems and that they uh, help their patients like saying go to the dentist because I, I don't see uh, enough of this and it's like a pity but maybe you see it more <laughs> often. I'm afraid that you are right. I'm very afraid that you are right because uh, physicians are still not uh, recognizing that bad teeth can cause problems, but not just in the eye of focal infection theory, but on the general. So we should all be aware of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so maybe I would just. I didn't, I'm not sure if I got it right from the presentation, but is it then true that like a, um, 
a, t a tooth that hurts is actually a good sign, so because it's not that, then it, it can be recognized easily and you go to the dentist, and in the opposite, the, the problem are actually teeth that don't hurt, but then cause a problem, is that, is, is, is that so? And so what should be approached in the light of that we should all be more aware of the disease of our teeth? What should be the approach to find all those teeth that cause problems? It's a question I think that Yona could <laughs> answer the best today. Would you well, like to try? I think that the meaning of this presentation was to make all of us aware, not only physicians, our patients, ourselves, even dentists, that bad teeth are associated with general health. But as you said, pain, so symptomatic non-vital teeth, is another topic, a very wide topic, because um, the localization of this pain is not always significant, is not always associated to the certain tooth, the non, this non-vital tooth, or it can be spread so the patient does not even recognize which tooth hurts him or her. So I think that all these tests, vitality tests, radiogra radiographical examination should be done to eliminate which tooth is the cause. And it, it's mostly, as I saw as a student working on, on the clinic, it is hard to elimin eliminate such a tooth and to treat it. As we have to be aware that um, our vital tooth can hurt because they get inflamed because of caries or periodontal disease, but when the tooth goes bad and die, this tooth still can hurt. So whenever we have a pain in our mouth, we have to check if this tooth is still vital and then that it needs a new filling or any kind of other restoration, or it's, it's inflamed so bad that it needs the vital extirpation, which is the first uh, first therapy we perform in endodontics, or if this tooth, uh, its pulp, it's already dead and infected and it needs uh, endodontic treatment. So the pain is always good, but um, the treatment is different. It's not diagnosing. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's, I, I would say that the take home message is go to the dentist <laughs> regularly, right, in yeah. every six months and hopefully we all become old without the without <laughs> being infection, <laughs> infection sites. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you again for your presentation and for your... Thank you. So Daniel, if I'm right, now we have the lunch break. Yes. One hour and see you here for the continuation of our Congress.
Okay, so welcome back. I hope you had a nice lunch. We are going on with the session number nine, immunology. We are going to talk about a very, very nice topic, which is uh, allergy and immunotherapy, the sooner the better. Let me welcome you in the pro corner on my right side, Mattia Chatei, the first fighter from Medical Faculty of Ljubljana. And the contra corner on my left side, Ms. Esther gadjis Lokar, which will be contra. The mentor is Dr. Matthias Homschak. If you could join us. Okay. Hello, everyone. With my colleague, Mattia, we will debate about a very new field in immunology. This is early allergen immunotherapy. We will start with a quick revision about the basics of the immune system. We have innate immunity responsible for early activation and killing by means of phagocytes and natural killer cells, and adaptive immunity, where lymphocytes encounter an invader learn how to attack it and remember it so they can attack it even more efficiently the next time. Here, the immune system can choose between two pathways. The humoral one with B cells, eosinophils and mast cells, driven by T helper cells type 2, and the cellular pathway with cytotoxic T cells and mm, macrophages, driven by T helper cells type 1. As you can see here, T helper naive cells can develop into both Th2 and Th1. We don't know all of the mechanisms involved yet, but we know T regulatory cells are very important, and various evidence suggests that the type of antigen presenting cell has a major influence, as does the presence of some cytokines and the concentration of the allergen. Now, Allergy is an inappropriate response of the immune system, also called hypersensitivity type 1. This is an immune response to a substance from the environment that most people's bodies perceive as harmless. As the allergen enters the body, it binds to an antigen-presenting cell, or APC. The antigen-presenting cell then presents the allergen to a T cell, which then develops into a T helper cell type 2. In allergic patients, the immune system has developed in such a way that a T helper cell type 2 response is preferred instead of Th1. Many theories exist on why that could happen, and maybe the most popular is the hygiene theory. Many bacteria and viruses elicit a Th1 response, which down-regulates Th2. So insufficient Th1 stimuli, such as in the increasingly sterile environment of developed countries, leads to an overactive Th2 arm, which in turn leads to allergic disease. So the Th2 cell drives B cells into IgE production. This IgE is then bind to mast cells and basophils. And when the allergen enters the body again, it binds to two IgE molecules and thus starts histamine degranulation and initiates the allergic reaction. Symptoms develop, which range from simple itchiness or runny nose and red eyes, to systemic life-threatening reactions such as anaphylaxis. And this is why we have tried to find ways to treat and manage allergies. We can simply avoid the allergen, but this of course is not always possible, or try symptomatic treatment like decongestants or antihistamines, antileukotrients, glucocorticoids, even adrenaline when necessary. However, the only disease-modifying treatment at present remains immunotherapy. Okay, so immunotherapy, or in our case, allergen-specific immunotherapy. Shortly, SIT is repeated administration of increasing doses of disease-causing allergens to modify the allergic response and induce uh, tolerance. Where did it come from? Uh, originally, people were convinced allergies were a reaction, were, was a reaction against toxins, and first experiments included immunizing animals with these toxins to obtain antisera that could neutralize the toxic effect in patients. 
these findings may be considered as an early indication that SIT actually represents a vaccine. So noon, uh, about 100 years ago, vaccinated patients against grass pollen with this toxin, and it, found, uh, and it was found that the treatment reduced allergic uh, symptoms and the sensitivity in these patients. Uh, yeah. How does it actually work? Yatrogenically presented allergens activate the production of regulatory T cells, also known as T-Rex cells, and these T-Rex suppress uh, TH2 and stimulate the growth of TH1 cells. They also stimulate B cells to prevent, uh, to produce IgG4 antibodies, and these IgG4 antibodies um, prevent allergen binding on IgE located on the surface of the mast cells, and thus blocking allergic reaction casca reactions cascade. After a short period of time, T cells induced by T regulatory cells outweigh TH2 cells and suppress the inappropriate response. Everything clear so far? Immunotherapy, allerg allergen immunotherapy is here and is happening. Uh, several studies were published about its clinical applications and about its long-lasting effects, even after discontinuation of treatment. The main question around which we'll construct our debate today is the sooner the better. When should we start with the treatment and is early SIT really the best way to, uh, possible when fighting allergies? Since I strongly agree with this point of view, uh, let me get right onto it. Earlier, I was talking about how Noon firstly vaccinated his patients, but these patients were already, or were already, already allergic. Uh, what if we could prevent allergies from happening altogether? From the analysis of bird co cohorts who were assessed for the development of allergic sensitizations, so sensitization, we, we are beginning to understand the stages in which allergies actually develop. For example, studies have shown the relationship between month of birth and the development of seasonal pollen allergies, suggesting sensitization occur only uh, in the first months of life. Another study that compared aller adult allergic patients with non-allergic subject subjects indicated that de novo allergic sensitization in general do does not occur. It is therefore possible that the window of sensitization exists only shortly after birth. Furthermore, experimental data from animal models have demonstrated that the transmission of the early mentioned uh, IgG4 antibodies, uh, both via, via placenta and breast milk, can transmit, suppress allergic sensitization in fetus. Why am I telling you all this? Because of treatment approaches. It gives us two options. Uh, one of them being the prenatal treatment by vaccination of the pregnant women or passive immunization and secondly early postnatal treatment uh, again with tolerance induction or vaccination only this time of a newborn child. Um, yep. SIT has not yet been used in such a manner as a prophylactic uh, vaccine, but it is clear that it would be a major step forward because it would not only be limited to, treated to treatment of already allergic patients, but would also prevent allergies and hence stop the current uh, exploding allergy epidemic. Okay, I have to stop you here. Don't you think this is a bit extreme? I mean, putting at risk a pregnant mother or a newborn like this? Immunotherapy can also be a double-edged sword and lead to sensitization against this allergen. Would you risk anaphylaxis to prevent an allergy that could not even develop by itself? Not to mention all the less severe but still disabling symptoms of allergies. Immunotherapy could possibly even lead to some other immune system derangements like autoimmunity or tumor cell tolerance. It is safer to wait and see if an allergy develops, and just then immunotherapy can really make the difference. And about this window of sensitization you mentioned, no research has been made. There is no real proof that sensitization can occur only shortly after birth. So you would put at risk the mother or the newborn, and maybe the baby would develop an allergy later on anyway. Okay, if I firstly respond to your comment about anaphylaxis, since there are no studies yet 
that the risks are significantly higher in any of the groups you compared. I suggest we I don't know, have another pro contra debate just about whether it's better to go to anaphylaxis due to immune, immunotherapy itself or go to an, die of anaphylactic sh uh, anaphylaxis later on due to a peanut or a bee sting, let's say. And okay. B, even there exist other later windows of sensitization, so what? We should focus on the one who develop first and try to prevent them from progressing. And thirdly, uh, if I would risk mother's or newborn's life, do not worry, no such treatment would pass directly onto them, before, not before making sure everything uh, was would be completely safe. I think we both agree on that one. We do. I think your concerns are, of course, on the right place, but are not much more than just generalized skepticism, I'm afraid. And early immunotherapy, I, I know that it still has its way ahead of itself, but on the contrary, I believe it has some very promising future indications. Let's say in children who have atopic parents and have a great uh, chance of being allergic themselves, uh, at least to some extent. The, especially here, I really see a great opportunity to try, to, to try with this preventive approach. And not only limited to the predisposed persons, we now that nowadays have the technology that allows population-wide testing for more than 100 individual allergen molecules that are providing us with interesting insights into regional differences and allergen recognitions. These relatively complete maps um, are likely to become available soon, and with them it should be possible to develop the strategies of preventive care programs. Uh, and these programs would be designed if pro on or profiled not only by regions, but probably maybe also individually. Well, this really seems like a promising technique, but I have to tell you, I have my doubts that this will ever be routine. Think about the costs of mapping the entire population, probably even more than once, since there's the possibility that the allergens in these regional allergen profiles may change. And sadly, I'm afraid adherence would also present a problem. I'm not sure how many people would agree to be part of such a project. Okay, I could agree with some of your points here, Esther, but listen some more. Earlier, you brought up the risk of developing new sensitizations when treating with SIT, uh, but there are already available new technologies that concern right on that specific matter. Uh, these technologies induce robust allergen-specific IgG response and their capacity to induce IgEs, so the bad ones, are, is very low. Um, uh, or even, they don't even provoke antibody responses altogether and only do selective T-cell tolerance. Again, all these dervites can be well suited for vaccination approaches because of very low risk of inducing allergic sensitization. You are trying to impress us with all these fancy techniques, but I'd like to point out here that some of them still lead to IgE production, and an allergic reaction remains possible, since the allergen first comes in contact with mucous membrane mast cells. Okay, so anyway, <laughs> let's move on to why should we even bother? A few sneezes here and there, Allergies do not seem to be often put on the pedestals of most disabling conditions in men, but uh, they can represent a huge burden uh, for the affected persons. As all allergic diseases, uh, allergies have a great impact on individuals' quality of life, uh, and this, I, I, by that I mean all, from mild and seasonal runny noses to persistent and severe systemic reaction. Uh, and moreover, it is already estimated that one in four people actually uh, is affected by these IgE-mediated allergies. Uh, that's a quarter of the population. And with increasing number of individual, individuals prone to these uh, reactions, to these allergies, it is expected that also the number of more serious cases will go up. SIT's cost effectiveness, again, it is, or it's leading in the right direction has been studied, but since it's very difficult to compare in view of differing national health insurances, epidemiological data, and so on, these findings still somehow remain questionable. 
Okay, of course you're right. For severely allergic patients, this can really be a new start. But this better quality of life with early immunotherapy can, al can only be present if nothing goes wrong with such early immunotherapy. As I said before, sensitization may occur instead of allergy prevention, and since neither the mechanisms regarding immunotherapy, neither those involved nor those involved in uh, very early immune system development, we cannot anticipate what short and long-term effects this treatment will have on the patient's immune system. Also, the allergy may not even present, both in sensitized patients and in those with a hereditary predisposition. So with the early immunotherapy, we could trigger allergy instead of preventing it. And this is why I think standard immunotherapy is a better choice when uh, allergy is already present and we know we can prevent it. Okay. And as I'm sure we could both go on to infinity of time, we settled our middle grounds on this example, namely late prophylaxis. And although this is not considered early immunotherapy per se, it can be approached by both of our points of view. Uh, the preventive allergy treatment study compared children with seasonal allergic rhinoconjunctivitis who were treated with SIT for three years with a control group, group and SIT was to significantly reduce the risk of developing asthma. These findings were confirmed in a follow-up of the study 10 years later and for me, it clearly shows that it is therefore possible to start with immunotherapy in a preventive manner uh, to prevent the progression of, the, at least in this type of allergic disease. Okay, so we are en at the end of our debate. Time to sum up. Once again, the sooner the better. There is no definitive answer yet. In theory, for now, sooner may seem better than later. But in practice, the promises are still a bit far-fetched. So on the pro side, we maybe have the possibility to root out allergies. And with the right indications, we can have a great cost-benefit ratio and improve the quality of life of all the potential future allergics. But on the contra side, we have to admit there are many risks interfering so early with the immune system. So we have to be cautious and, of course, do more research in this field. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Esther and Mattia, for this wonderful topic and debate. Are there any questions? No one, really? <laughs> Dr. Homshak, would you comment to this debate? Oh, I would say Esther and Mattia, great. Uh, I think it's a very hard topic to discuss about that, but they do a tremendous job. So, uh, as, I, as, as you heard all, we have some kind of window, windows of opportunity. And uh, in children, we try to find out which are these times when the, day the baby was born, uh, was born and when can we jump in and make some, uh, make some uh, changes especially in children which are very prone to allergies. So uh, nowadays we have few studies, but they are still in uh, progress and they are prospective, so we don't have re the results. Uh, as we know, we, we, you must understand something that uh, in the time of development, in the time of development of life, uh, we, first we have the possibility that somebody could be allergic. And that's the time when uh, there are there are these huge changes uh, in the child before uh, he, were, he was born and later that, he com that comes to the synthesization. The synthesization thing is may maybe the first opportunity when can we uh, jump in with the earlier immunotherapy. Maybe that was a year one and maybe a year two after a uh, child's birth. But later in life, we all know that we, when we start with the immunotherapy, when the allergy was uh, confirmed, we have a good results, but they, we are not so, they're not, the results are not so good as we try to do that. Maybe, maybe 50 to 70 percent response very good to immunotherapy. Uh, the, the, the rest not. And they still need the medications that they don't have such a quality of life. So if, if I uh, consume, I must say that first of all, it's, pre, pre, uh, it's uh, 
some kind of uh, presentation period. What will we do there? No, no answer. Then we have this sensitization period. Where, where, what, what could we confirm with some tests? Maybe we have some kind of allergy in the test, but no uh, disease. And later is a disease time with uh, fully developed clinical symptoms. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions now? Over there, the lady in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, my question is uh, not totally serious, as in uh, I would like to ask about the hygiene theory. It maybe we could recommend a dirtier childhood to people, because I don't know, it's not totally concerning allergen immunotherapy, but kind of is. So could we say, like, play on the ground, eat dirt and everything, so you will be healthier? Well, if I may start. Uh, while I was preparing for the debate, I was thinking the same way, you know, isn't interfering with the immune system, you know, playing, uh, letting your child play in the, on the street or whatever, isn't that, you know, uh, there are no studies of that being, you know, so no, no one's extremely cautious about that, you know, and as soon as someone a word a vaccine comes up or something like that, it's another story. That was just something that I no. want to point out. We, ha we have studies about hygiene hypothesis, and uh, this study shows us that, that children which are exposed to the dirt, as you said, especially children from the, from the farms, there's a huge study from uh, Bavarian region uh, this study, um, I think it's about 10, year, 10 years old. This, this study shows that children which are exposed to the endotoxins uh, from animals and uh, animals dander and so on, uh, they're not, in these families, uh, they're, 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 these families have a really rare allergic, uh, there, are really, there are really few allergic diseases in these families. Opposite to the, to the cities where, live, uh, where the people live in uh, good hygiene uh, standard and uh, these people have has much more allergies. Also, an opposite when when children come from the countries where there is a, where, where, where this uh, social economic uh, uh, ground is not so good, and they move to the cities where the the uh, where this opposite, then they can develop the allergies in um, uh, much. Uh, uh, I must say, I'd like to say. Uh, 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 sorry. At higher rate. At high rate, that's true, yes. So we should say eat dirt. Like, we should say to people, let your children eat dirt and play with animals and everything so they will be healthier. In, I yes, mean, in some kind of way, yes. Not I, don't want, I don't want them to get Jardia Lamblia, but like, <laughs> to be healthier. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Yeah, over here. Uh, just a uh, Koshnik. Uh, just few comments <coughs> about that uh, concern uh, that immunotherapy provokes autoimmune diseases. Uh, recently, a uh, large Danish study was published comparing enormous uh, 10,000 of uh, people uh, treated for high fever, some were treated with drugs, some with immunotherapy, and in a group of people treated with immunotherapy or long term, the incidence of autoimmune diseases and overall mortality was significantly lower than in people not treated with allergen yeah, specific of course. immunotherapy. My, my concern with autoimmunity was about interfering with the immune system early before it's developed in its whole way. <laughs> just just something about about hygiene hypothesis. The <coughs> the the um, the idea is not to eat dust, but to inhale endotoxin at, at the time uh, when you're exposed to, to allergens. So that's that's mechanism of protection of, of, of dust. Uh, not eating, but inhaling. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Dr. Koshnik. Are there any other questions? Not really, so I think we can go on with the next debate from immunology session. Thank you very much. Uh, so the next topic is the only treatment for food allergies is abstinence 
And I'd like to invite on my right side, in the pro corner, Ms. Ivana Palk from Medical Faculty of Ljubljana. And in the contra corner, on the left side, Ms. Taida Schrott from University of Maribor. Thank you. So hello everyone, uh, I'm Ivana and I'm Taida. Just a moment please. <laughs> okay, we're going to wait a few seconds for some technical problems. You can see our sponsors here. <laughs> in the meantime, I would like to remind you that at the end we will, uh, at, the at the end, s active speakers will have some prizes based on your own votes. So if you haven't voted yet, there is the box for voting. And also passive participants will receive some presents if they will be lucky enough. Um, so now I'm back. <laughs> um, looks like there were some technical problems with the video, but I hope it will work. Uh, so to start again, I'm Ivana. Yeah, and, and I'm Taina. Hello, everyone. And, yeah. And today we are going to tell you something about the treatments given to uh, for food allergies. Uh, today it is estimated that 6 to 8 percent of all children and nearly 4 percent of adults have a food allergy. So it represents a significant, a significant health issue and it can be a life-threatening condition. So I am now asking you, what do you think? Is it abstinence the only treatment for food allergies? Hands up if you think so. <laughs> okay, the minority of us thinks so. Well, I think so, but Taida doesn't. Uh, so, let's move on. Uh, food allergies are hypersensitivity in which the immune response extends and recognizes environmental antigens that should be innocuous as uh, foreign pathogens. So um, it can be triggered by two immunological mechanisms, which are IgE-mediated, those are most food allergies, and non-IgE-mediated, such as uh, celiac disease, which is also cell-mediated food allergies. But we also know mixed type, so IgE and cell-mediated food allergy. Um, Speaking of IgE-mediated food allergies, symptoms appear within two hours after ingestion. And as the allergen is absorbed in the gut, can cause uh, severe abdominal pain, cramps, uh, diarrhea, also uh, acute vomiting. And then as the antigen diffuses, can cause those symptoms that you can see on the slide, such acute urticaria, flare or eczema, rhinitis, bronchospasm, and asthma, or general reactions such as anaphylaxis. Speaking of non-IgE-mediated allergies, uh, its symptoms appear hours or days after ingestion. So uh, it shows like dermatitis, herpetiformis, and celiac disease in gut as food-induced uh, food enterocolitis in the respiratory tract as food-induced pulmonary hemosiderosis. So uh, the most common allergens are peanuts, shrimps, eggs, milk, soy, and hazelnuts. Now in our presentation, we will focus on IgE-mediated allergy that can cause anaphylactic shock. That's the main issue. We know that uh, approximately 1% of children is allergic to peanuts. Uh, more rare food allergens are potatoes, apples, kiwi, peaches, and grapes. 
So, uh, but we know also OAS, which uh, the, are some allergens that cause oral allergy syndrome. This means that the patient is, for example, allergic to some grass or pollen or some tree, and then ingesting some other food, aller uh, other food like uh, some apple can trigger a similar reaction to an allergy. So now, yeah. okay, uh, Ivana, yeah. Ivana has already uh, told you uh, everything about EG mediated allergy, but now for understanding it the better, we'll, we're going to see a video describing the cellular mechanism behind it. So, hope Please. it works. Mm -hmm. It is not. <laughs> so let's go forward and you'll describe the picture. Okay, I'll <laughs> describe it. So we have a peanut. And we eat a peanut, which is then represented to, uh, uh, which is then um, uh, uh, processed by the dendritic cell and represented further to an allergen-specific T cell. This uh, activates T helpers too, as we have seen in previous um, debate. And then uh, inter, uh, uh, severe interleukines are um, released. Uh, those interleukines um, then activate beta cells, which, uh, which as a consequence release allergen-specific EGE. And those EGE antibodies bind to mast cell, and the patient is sensitized. But here I would like to is explain the difference between a sensitization and allergy. The thing about a sensitization is that it, it means the first exposure to the allergen. The allergy can develop from a sensitization, and the allergy is usually uh, hap happens when uh, there's a weak exposure to allergen. So we need to understand the difference between, between the sensitization and the allergy. Okay, so then when the patient is, or someone, anyone of us, uh, uh, who is sensitized, uh, eats an, a peanut for a second or, th or the third time, I don't know, uh, then uh, the mast cell degranulation happens, which uh, for a, a consequence, uh, histamines, leukotrienes, cytokines, prostaglandins, and other um, factors are released, which uh, results uh, in local and system systemic symptoms, and we have an allergic reaction. Ivana has already described uh, but let's, uh, let's say it again. Local symptoms are swelling, itching, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, and systemic symptoms are airway obstruction, hives, blood pressure drop, and arrhythmia. Well, systemic symptoms are mostly about anaphylaxis, and anaphylaxis, as we know, is a life-threatening condition. So this is what worries us the most about food allergy. To continue, here we have a uh, uh, an example, example of local symptom, skin symptom. So, now about augmentation. When, when can we expect that anaphylaxis is going to occur? Well, of course, when we have a patient who has previously had a previous anaphylaxis, anaphylaxis or has severe asthma, but known cofactors also include sports, Mastocytosis, if we remember when we were talking about the whole process and mast cells uh, with, binded, uh, with binded EGE uh, antibodies, and of course, non steroid anti inflammatory drugs and infections. So, uh, those uh, patients who are expected to have anaphylactic shock usually carry an epinephrine uh, pen, in, uh, so to, uh, in, or in uh, case an anaphylaxis happens. Okay, so now diagnosis. How do we diagnose food allergy? Well, the most known and most commonly used is definitely the skin prick test, which is usually done on the forearm here or on the back. Some of you may, or may have already experienced it. I have. <laughs> so, okay. Then uh, the, what I would like to tell here is that it shows the, the, shows the desensitization. And you remember when I told you the difference between sensitization and allergy. Someone may be sensitized, but he's not allergic. It's a difference. So it shows, shows us this sensitization, mostly. But of course, the allergy. But one cannot be aller allergic, but is sensitized and is positive. So yeah. Then we have serum uh, EGE, which is basically similar to skin prick test in means of it shows that the, sensi the sensitization and uh, allergy, not the allergy itself. So we, we may have a patient who is sensitized, but not allergic. 
Well, the more specific is and sensitive is definitely the, the basophil activation test, which is, um, which is most commonly used uh, in the combination with skin prick test. And it's, uh, in this test, we measure, um, we measure the, the CD of 63 positive cells, uh, and this helps us to discover the allergy. Okay, <laughs> no. Uh, the most important and the most specific uh, is definitely the oral food challenge um, because it shows us the symptoms. So, okay, so now I have a question for you. Do you think that the positive test for peanut and birch means that the patient is allergic to both of the allergens? Who thinks that it, uh, it means that? Hands up, please. Okay, <laughs> majority disagrees. Well, the thing here is that one patient can be sensitized to only one or to both of those allergens, or he might, uh, he might be uh, allergic to one or both of them. The thing is that peanut RAH8 uh, antigen is similar in structure to bat V1 uh, antigen in, in birch. So one patient can be allergic to only one of them, and the result is positive for both, or he, he can be sensitized to one or both of them, if you understand what I mean. <laughs> okay, so we need to understand the, the skin. So, okay. so, yeah, in food allergies, can we speak about prevention? Of course we can. We know that breastfed children have a lower incidence of food allergies, although there is evidence that sensitization can be uh, caused by the allergen diffusing through mother's milk. Uh, so in case that the infant is from a high-risk family, we give them a hypoallergenic formulas, such as described on the slide, and also it's very important to start uh, with solid food between four and six months, and not before, because it's seen that early sensitization with solid foods such as eggs and uh, soy or other stuff can cause uh, a major, uh, it is a major risk for developing an allergic, an, aller, um, an allergy. Uh, but delaying, like uh, uh, this um, eating solid food, like uh, seen from one year of age and on, it's not seen, there's no evidence that this can uh, decrease any sensitization to it. Um, there is no evidence that probiotics are useful in this case of prevention, but fish consumption during, during first year can lead in uh, minor egg sensitization in patients who are on a high risk. So what's the best way to treat food allergy? Of course, food avoidance. So uh, it is still today the mainstay of treatment of all food allergies. Uh, for extremely sensitive patients, uh, avoidance includes also avoiding inhaling some food allergen and also touching some food allergen. So um, also uh, those patients should be on appropriate uh, dietetic counseling and they should be on monitoring if they are still uh, growing, such as children. And also duration of the avoidance should be no longer than necessary to achieve a significant relief of symptoms. This is like from two to four weeks, usually. Uh, oral food challenge should be performed at regular intervals. So every six to 12 months, a patient tries to eat egg or milk and sees if he's still allergic to it. Um, but also it is really important for the patient to learn how to avoid the food allergen. I mean, reading food labels, avoiding the food allergen in any way, and informing the community, family, friends, and coworkers about the new food allergy. And as Taida said, carrying EpiPen, uh, injectable epinephrine. Okay, but uh, Ivana, we need to keep in mind that mal mal malnutrition can happen due to the lack of vitamins and minerals, and of course, lower quality of life, as it leads to lack of spontaneity, less choice, embarrassment, and discrimination. Especially if if we keep in mind that this is uh, this is mo this, these patients are mostly children. 
then, of course, intentional or unintentional exposure to food allergen can be life-threatening. The most concerning fact it is that the most uh, location for anaphylaxis to occur is kindergartens and schools, where 16 to 22 um, um, reactions occur. Then uh, I have a question. Are there other ways to treat food allergy? Do you think there are? Yes or no? Yes? Yeah, yes, there are. And now we're going to see through them. So, okay. Uh, here we have a list, and we, ha we have probiotics, uh, which affects the uh, different type of microorganism, but uh, uh, using probiotics can't lead to desensitization as it, they work mostly locally and th they don't act on mast cells. Then we have mast cell stabilizers, uh, food processing, for example, uh, peanut, uh, peanuts without uh, ARA2 antigen, but the problem here is that they are uh, quite inaccessible and expensive. Then anti ejae treatment, which is also quite inaccessible and uh, expensive. And th uh, then we have um, last, but not least, the allergen immunotherapy, which our colleagues have already described, but we're going to see, it, uh, to see through it again. Okay. So, another question. Do you think that owning a, pet, uh, a cat pet could lead to a desensitization? Who thinks yes? Up, hands up. Oh, half and half, okay. Uh, well, the thing is that uh, studies have shown that owning a cat pet uh, can lead to cat fur allergy desensitization. But if we have a cat pet in the neighborhood, but not our home, this could lead to a sensitization to cat fur. Um, so we can apply that to food allergy, and we can expose uh, a patient to high doses of allergen, and this could lead to a desensitization, possibly. Okay, so we're going to see through allergy immunotherapy um, cellular mechanism again. So we expose our patient to high dose allergen, and this, in th this is then processed by a dendritic cell, which uh, consequently releases interleukin 10. Um, then, then uh, T-Rex, uh, regulatory T lymphocytes, are activated, which release interleukin 10 and TGF beta. Um, as a consequence, beta cells are activated, and they release less EGE, which is important in food allergy, as we have already seen. And uh, more EGG4 antibodies are produced, and EGA antibodies. If you remember from a previous debate, we have talked about EGG4 uh, antibodies that um, that um, work uh, on mast cells and consequently uh, binding of EG antibodies is prevented. Then uh, T-Rex further act inhibitory on basophils, eosinophils, and mastocytes, which are, which are important in food allergy, and less leukotrienes and prostaglandins are released. As a consequence, it leads to epithelial, less epithelial apoptosis and um, uh, smooth muscle perforation and myopia fibroblast activation. Um, T-Rex also work inhibitory on T helper cells, um, already mentioned in previous debate. Uh, TH2 cells uh, release interleukin 4, 5, and 13, and they are responsive for mucus production and bronchial hyperresponsive. So if you block T, T2, T uh, helpers 2, it leads to less mucus production and, of course, less bronchial hyperresponsiveness. On the other side, we have uh, T helpers 1, uh, which release uh, interferon um, gamma and TNF alpha, and it's as uh, T-Rex uh, act inhibitory on them, less of, of those are, um, are uh, released. And it leads um, synergistic, synergistically with mastocytes, eosinophils, and basophils, uh, and leads to less epithelial, uh, epithelial apoptosis and smooth muscle proliferation. So, in shortly, about desensitization. Okay, so we have three different ways of oral allergy immunotherapy. So we have first oral immunotherapy, here. Then subcutaneous, subcutaneous immunotherapy and sublingual immunotherapy. But I would like to emphasize that safety should always be uh, considered the first and the most important. Um, then, um, okay, um, we should think also about the cost and the convenience, but always the safety is the most important, the safety of the patient, of course. Okay, so now I have a trial that confirms uh, the e e efficiency of 
uh, allergy immunotherapy. Um, and the oral immunotherapy was done uh, with the administration of small but increasing doses of peanut protein. Um, for example, an average peanut contains uh, 160 uh, milligram of peanut protein, um, but we have different variations. Uh, well, the small but decreasing doses were applied to children who were allergic to peanuts, and it has been shown to increase their reactive threshold, uh, and it enabled them to eat uh, varying amounts of peanut without reactions. Then, a phase two randomized controlled crossover trial of peanut oral immu immunotherapy, recently published in The Lancet, investigated the role of peanut oral immunotherapy in 9 and 19 children, inclusive of all severities of peanut allergy. In the active group, 84% were desensitized to 800 milligram, whereas, whereas 24 of 39 patients were successfully desensitized to 1,400 milligrams of peanut pro proteins, which equal, equals about 10 peanuts. So, um, a significant 25-fold increase of their peanut threshold and, uh, was made, and their uh, caregivers had a significant, significant improvement in quality of life. Uh, and uh, here, ad uh, adverse eff effects in most were mild and easily treatable, so no anaphylaxis. Well, you had your time. Now let's talk about problems of this allergen immunotherapy. There are quite a few. Like definition of the severity of the disease before starting treatment, there, the, the severity of the disease is different in each patient. Then optimal protocols must be established. Definition of criteria for oral and sublingual immunotherapy. Safety issues, as you mentioned, I am totally agreeing with that, and also optimal time point. Our colleagues, uh, especially Esther, pointed this out. Uh, the duration of treatment, we know that immunotherapy, we still don't know how much time uh, should be this treatment done for sure. Uh, and also long-term efficacy and safety. Does this treatment, uh, is this treatment really so effica uh, efficient uh, in a such efficient in such a long term time? And preventive capacity, I don't know. We can lead it. Uh, we can lead our patient into anaphylaxis, and also uh, it can also development of generally accepted primary outcome measures. And we need to identify immunological biomarkers. And also, immunotherapy is really, really expensive. We know that for one treatment, it's like 2,500 uh, 2, euros in Slovenia. But in Europe, it's like from uh, nearly 1,200 uh, euros to uh, nearly 3,000 euros. So that's quite uh, more expensive than abstinence, don't you think? And economic studies on the preventive effect must be done. And uh, we can influence the natural course of disease because we know that a lot of, chil a lot of children that are allergic to soy, this means like 50% of children that are, are allergic to soy, milk, egg, peanut, will outgrow their food allergy by the age of six. So is it this really useful as a therapy for them? I don't know. So we, uh, we have come to conclusions. So we need to keep in mind that, that sensitization doesn't equal allergy, to, as we have already uh, described. Then uh, EGE-mediated allergy can lead to anaphylaxis, which is life-threatening condition. And of course, abstinence is still the key treatment. And recombinant food peanuts and food processing, like milk and eggs, might improve life quality. Uh, allergen immunotherapy is a potential treatment. But, however, more, more investigation must be done. So. Okay, thank you, Tyler and Ivana. Any questions? I, I would have one for Dr. Homshak. A recombinant food was mentioned. Could that be an alternative uh, solution? Yes, there was a paper published, I think, three or four months ago, which shows us that recombinant food, as we talk about peanuts, uh, was introduced in the market in the States. 
uh, but the costs are very high, we know that. So it's a possibility for, uh, for people which are allergic to RIH2, as you mentioned in uh, peanut allergy. Okay, but we, we have other problems. You are, you, as you see, both these lectures are a little covered in many things. Uh, maybe this one is more practical because uh, truly in the real life we must avoid the food if we are allergic to some kind of food. That's a problem that uh, have impact on quality of life. Uh, the introducing the food to allergic uh, person, it's a problem because we don't know exactly what kind of, what, what kind of uh, dose he will tolerate at the time of uh, oral immunotherapy. And uh, we know from the studies that when we introduce the food, um, I don't know exactly which, it's important which, which level uh, to a patient, uh, there are really some kind of desynthesized. But at the time when we stop the uh, desynthesization or oral immunotherapy, then we, we still have the problems with allergy in two to three weeks. So the future is maybe in new vaccines. I don't know exactly. Recombinant allergens in vaccines, specially prepared vaccines. I don't know. The time will show us. Thank you very much for the answer. Any other questions? One there. Question. Um, do you see any way how the diet of um, from the newborn till someone is one year old. Uh, if you can see any way how this diet uh, can be changed in regard to when to introduce certain foods and how to do it. Uh, now, the new recommendations uh, show us that uh, the solid food must be introduced in the time between three and three and a half to four months of age. Uh, four months are reserved only for. Uh, uh, for uh, mother's milk. Uh, the, la the later studies in the 90s and the start of 2000, uh, they recommend only the mother's milk in the first six to eight months, but nowadays we know that's not okay. So uh, we, before we talk about these windows of opportunity and the uh, civilization period is especially in the first six months, uh, we know from this uh, epidemiological studies that's that's the right time when we introduce the child really a different food but in families which are allergic uh, we try to say that is better after after the six, six months of uh, age these are recommendations and they are really true in most of the people thank you there's another question there the lady in the corner curious about certain infections that may uh, worsen allergies or provoke them, kind of, like uh, in atopic families, I'm not sure, but I think there are, if like we mm, protect more the children and they don't get ill, it is possible that they won't develop allergies or something, or it's just a myth? I think I don't understand you quite good. That's Not about the English, but I think uh, the no. problem, it's a problem in a small child, uh, early infection, or you talk about in general in allergic person. I thought about children mostly because uh, children in kindergarten get ill a lot, like all the time. But yes. yeah, maybe also in general population, if it's possible, like, I don't know, because stimulating the immune system and everything. Yeah, okay. Uh, yes, we know that uh, children, which in families where there's, there's a, they are ex extremely exposed to infection, there's not so much allergy that comes uh, together with this, uh, st uh, these epidemiological studies as we talked before, in lecture before. And uh, if, an, if an infection later in life has an influence on allergy, I don't know, I couldn't answer that. Maybe, Mitya, you can say something. Really, I don't know. Okay, any other question? No? Good, so I'd like to thank the debaters and mentor Dr. Homshak for the both debates. We have a break now, in 10 minutes, see you later.
new session, pulmonology. The next debate is asthma, COPD, overlap syndrome, myth or reality? This will not be exactly pro and contra. We have asthma and COPD. So on the asthma side, we have um, Andrei Hosnik from the Medical Faculty of Ljubljana. And on the COPD side, Ginevra Rizzonelli from the Medical Faculty of Bologna. Their mentor, Matthias Torel, uh, could not be present today, so I'm inviting Dr. Uh, Mitya Koshnik to join me here. Uh, so, hello everyone. Uh, Jeannie and I are going to discuss asthma COPD overlap syndrome. Uh, the syndrome, it's a wide scientific consensus that the syndrome is in fact a reality. This, this is why our mentor suggested us to uh, discuss the two aspects of the syndrome. I'm going to present the asthmatic point of view and Jeannie is going to present the COPD point of view of the syndrome. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll start off talking about ACAB, which is a famous acronym used all over the world to address uh, cops as all cops are bastards and we, we start off like this because we want to stress the fact that phenotyping is important but sometimes can lead to misunderstandings and uh, we will talk about ACOS and say how important it is to um, uh, diagnose ACOS patients but still there are a few cases in which this can mislead. So let's take a brief look at history. Uh, Dutch hypothesis was proposed in the 1960s and it proposes that all airway obstructive diseases are in fact a single airway disease that have different manifestations and these manifestations are emphysema, chronic bronchitis and asthma. As we all know, these three entities overlap to different extents and we all know COPD is the overlap of emphysema and chronic bronchitis. But today the definition has changed a little bit. Nowadays, ACOS is also defined as a, an overlap syndrome, but uh, the different components, components play a different role than it, they used to play in the past. And uh, uh, we call uh, uh, COPD the overlap between chronic bronchitis and emphysema, while asthma is a different entity and it can overlap with uh, COPD and both chronic, chronic bronchitis and emphysema, and all of them are uh, regarded in the classification of airflow obstruction diseases. So we have different schemes to represent the different phenotypes we, we can come up with. So can we differentiate one from another? First, we have to take into account the symptoms of both diseases. If we have a, an ACOS patient, we have to take a look at the symptoms. In asthma patients, the symptoms are usually episodic, uh, and patients have periods of complete remission. The disease begins early in life and is often also associated with ATP. COPD is a progressive condition. Early in the disease, patients are asymptomatic, and as the disease worsens in middle age and beyond, dyspnea and exacerbations become more common, making the symptoms also very useful in uh, uh, diagnosing COPD. So, spirometry can be used to differentiate be between the two because asthma is characteristically completely reversible. The airflow obstruction is reversible by use of bronchodilators, which is not the case in ACOS. Uh, but let's take a point of view from asthma. Asthma is a chronic inflammatory disease. Uh, it is characteristically obstructive disease uh, in which the airflow obstruction is variable, so it becomes better with use of bronchodilators. But inflammation and airflow obstruction lead to bronchial hyperresponsiveness. The three uh, orange highlighted, highlighted uh, words here are going to be discussed in more detail in the, as we present. Now we'll take a look at the goal definition of COPD, which can also help us in uh, um, selecting a few characteristics that uh, will help us distinguish in between the two di diseases, which also, um, uh, which both 
uh, are present in the overlap syndrome. So it is a chronic obstructive disease and very common and preventable and treatable and uh, characterized by persistent airflow obstruction, which is usually progressive and uh, leads uh, and is associated with an inflammatory response uh, and also exacerbations and comorbidities are very common. We will now look at uh, a few of the characteristics we mentioned in the definitions and uh, use them to find diagnostic tools that help us distinguish between the two diseases. First of all, we'll take a look at site of airflow, airflow obstruction. So in asthmatic patients, uh, as the disease is mild, patients have values of central and peripheral resistance that are similar to those of normal subjects. As the disease progresses, so does the obstruction, which becomes more peripheral in nature. So in long-standing asthma, the obstruction is similar to those patients with COPD. And the main site of this irreversible obstruction is usually the peripheral airways. Uh, so what are the next uh, things we have to take into account when we want to differentiate the two diseases? Let's take a look at the progression of airflow limitation. How does it progress with the disease? In asthma, the it's usually first, at first it's variable. The obstruction is variable and as the in inflammation increases, so does the remodeling of the airways, which leads to hyper-responsiveness. And the obstruction becomes persistent, which is typical of uh, asthma COPD overlap syndrome. But it ta takes decades uh, to achieve that state. We w what we want to, pro to stress here is that COPD is also a progressive airway obstruction and it, is, uh, it has pretty much the same pathophysiology in that we have an airway inflammation which leads to remodeling of the mucosa and then we have chronic persistent airway obstruction and hyperresponsiveness. The difference between the two is very important and plays a role in distinguishing them in that we have a very rapid pr progression which only takes a few years and not uh, the case like in asthma. So do the definitions of COPD and asthma help us? We already looked at two of these characteristics uh, um, and now we will look at abnormal inflammatory response. So there are... Uh, in COPD we have a neutrophilic bronchitis uh, which is very characteristic but we have to take into consideration that uh, during exacerbations we have also eosinophils in the sputum. And meanwhile asthma is characteristically eosinophilic bronchitis but neutrophils can also infiltrate the airways because there are many phenotypes of asthma itself. And even when an asthmatic patient has uh, severe exacerbations or other diseases such as acute infections, neutrophils can be present in the sputum. But can biomarkers distinguish the two diseases? First, we can take a look at the exhaled nitrogenous oxide, which is characteristically elevated with inflammation in the airways. We know that inflammation occurs in both asthma and COPD, so exhaled NO cannot be effectively used in distinguishing them. But sputum eosinophils could be. The problem is that many labs don't provide this analys analysis, and it's also not sensible to use because we have many other investigations which help us differentiate the two diseases. So now let's take a look at uh, extrapulmonary effects which can differentiate asthma from COPD. Uh, as for systemic consequences, of course COPD is the one with the most uh, between the two in that we have uh, nutritional abnormalities, weight loss, hypoxemia, skeletal muscle dysfunction, cardiovascular disease, depression, osteoporosis and anemia which all characterize um, or can characterize COPD patients. Uh, they are all due to the same uh, underlying cause which is an underlying systemic inflammation and that can also be measured with the help of the, of the labs by measuring a rise in CRP and TNF alpha but we have to take into consideration that not always uh, we can ask the labs to, to measure a TNF alpha. Asthma itself does not have so many systemic consequences by which it could be characterized, but it has some comorbidities uh, such as vasculitis, allergic rhinitis or conjunctivitis and atopic dermatitis that are all associated with asthma. Other diagnostic tools that can be used in distinguishing the, the two are uh, x-rays. Here we questioned ourselves whether is it sensible to use high resolution CT. Emphysema is typical of COPD, but it also presents in ACOS patients. 
and in uh, asthmatic patients that have a very long run of asthma. Because overall, one third of asthmatic patients are smokers, and practically all patients with ACOS are smokers too. Is the diffusing capacity of carbon monoxide also useful? We, we, we think it is, in that the LCO uh, is actually lower normally in most COPD patients because we have a loss of surface area. Uh, instead, in asthma, we have an enlargement of surface area, which leads to a DLCO, which is either normal, which is in most cases, but sometimes it can even be high. Does it matter differentiating between the two? Uh, we think it does matter. So uh, that's the whole point of the presentation when we say that it is actually reality and not a myth, and that uh, asthma uh, has seen a, death, uh, a decline in death rates and hospitalizations since the 90s, while for COPD patients, these death rates and hospitalizations haven't decreased at all, and they have been stable for the past decades. So di differentiating between, between the two of them may help in choosing the appropriate treatment and improving the prognosis of a single patient. Yes, it does matter to differentiate the two, as Jeannie said, but sometimes we, sometimes we simply can't. That's when GINA and GOLD guidelines from last year come in handy uh, because they uh, have a stepwise approach to diagnosing ACOS. First, we diagnose the chronic airway disease that is obstructive in nature. Then we have to take into account all the symptoms that patient uh, experiences. If the symptoms overlap significantly, so he has, the patient has less than three symptoms in each of the diseases, we can consider the diagnosis of ACOS. The patients have feature of features of both diseases in this case. After that, we perform spirometry, which characteristically in asthma spirometry would be uh, reversible. The obstruction would uh, better itself after the use of bronchodilators. Uh, in ACOS, this is not the case. So this is, uh, again, one step further to confirming the diagnosis. And after that, we start the initial treatment and assess the success of this treatment. Initial treatment in ACOS is supposed to be inhaled corticosteroids and LABA as an add-on therapy. This is, these are long-acting beta agonists. Uh, if we are not successful in diagnosing the disease, of course, we have to uh, refer the patient to a specialized center. Uh, what are the goals of management in both diseases? So, because what really matters here is the quality of life and uh, the treatment, the appropriate treatment of the patients. In asthma, we tend to achieve normal lung function uh, with as little symptoms as possible in patients and maintain normal quality of life. We do that by preventing and treating exacerbations, which in turn prevents mortality. As for COPD patients, we try to relieve symptoms mostly, but of course we try also to prevent disease pro progression and improve uh, exercise tolerance as well as health status and prevent complications and exacerbations. And uh, we do make an effort to reduce mortality, although that's not always the case. Uh, we have similarities and differences uh, as we saw in the previous slide, and both uh, among the similarities, we can stress the fact that both uh, uh, management of both diseases have uh, both pharmacological and non-pharmacological approaches. Uh, both diseases have a step-up approach to therapy uh, according to the severity of disease and the control of the disease itself. And management of asthma is focused on treating inflammation and returning the patient to as normal status as possible. As for the management of COPD, it's mostly symptom-based in that uh, we cannot really return to a normal status for those patients. Non-pharmacological therapy in asthma uh, encompasses identifying and avoiding triggers in patients, such as allergens and irritants. So we have to educate patients to identify and avoid these triggers. They also have to cease smoking in case they do. Uh, we have to take into account under, uh, other underlying conditions that may result in asthma or that may worsen asthma, such as allergic rhinitis, sinusitis, and uh, GERD. Uh, of course, it's important to educate patients to use uh, short-acting beta agonists appropriately if exacerbations occur. 
As for COPD, we also, also have a very important non-pharmacological therapy, uh, which is important at all stages of the disease. And uh, uh, first of all, we try and avoid smoke as, uh, uh, as it is one of the main causes of it, and uh, also uh, try to avoid indoor and outdoor uh, exposures. We try and vaccinate our patients against influenza and pneumococcal uh, in order to prevent exacerbations and uh, we help them also optimizing their nutrition, give them oxygen therapy, uh, pulmonary rehabilitation and in a few selected patients also surgical intervention might be useful. Among all these the two most important ones are of course smoking cessation and oxygen therapy although I, I have to say oxygen has to be regarded as a, a pharmacological therapy in some uh, sense. Uh, often, non-pharmacological therapy is not enough. That's when we have to consider medications. In asthma, anti-inflammatory anti drugs uh, play the first role in treating the disease. Inhaled corticosteroids are usually used the first, then anti-leukotriens can be added. Also, some other drugs can be used. Uh, as the disease progresses, we have to add uh, long-acting beta agonists to the therapy and educate the patients to use short-acting beta agonists in case exacerbations occur. Of course, in the most severe cases, we can also consider anti-IgE therapy. As for COPD patients, the first line of therapy is bronchodilators, both uh, beta agonists and uh, uh, anticholinergic, as well as theophylline. And uh, in, um, as a second line therapy, we also use anti inflammatory drugs uh, such as inhaled corticosteroids and roflumilast. Uh, and later in the disease, we, we try and use uh, a combination therapy w between the two and antibi antibiotics in, during exacerbations. Uh, but uh, it's, it is to stress the fact that the first line is different in the two diseases, and uh, bronchodilators uh, are the most important medication in COPD. Uh, yeah, we'll also talk about it now because inhaled corticosteroids are the most important treatment in asthma. They improve lung function, improve overall health status and symptoms of patient, uh, decrease exacerbations and the severity of the exacerbations and in turn decrease mortality uh, because of their significant anti-inflammatory anti effects. This is why we use inhaled corticosteroids as a first-line therapy even in mild asthma. Although in COPD patients we do have a modest effect on long-term deterioration of the lung function and a significant decrease in exacerbations as well as an improvement in health status, we have absolutely no effect on mortality and there is an increased risk of pneumonia we have to take into consideration. And that's why guidelines do recommend uh, inhaled corticosteroids only for severe disease and in patients with recurrent exacerbations. ICS lava can be used as the disease progresses, and it's also the first line therapy in ACOS patients. In asthma, lava is considered as an add on therapy when ICS alone fails to achieve control. Uh, the both drugs combined, of course, improve symptoms and lung function and decrease need for SABAs and reduce exacerbations themselves. As for COPD patients, uh, we use ICS only as an add-on therapy, and so the combination therapy is recommended only in severe disease, meaning FEV1 under 50% with repeated exacerbations. And uh, we do see an improving symptoms, lung function, and uh, uh, reducing the need for rescue SABAS. We have a modest effect on mortality, and there is still to take in consi into consideration an increased risk of pneumonia. Uh, now let's take a look at other anti-inflammatory therapies that uh, play a role in asthma especially. Uh, leukotriene modifiers have a role as a monotherapy in mild asthma and they're also uh, used as an add-on therapy. In the most severe cases, as I've mentioned before, we can use anti-IgE therapy. Uh, I think it's omalizulab. Uh, if we fail to achieve asthma control despite ICS therapy, but there is no role for uh, reflumilast in asthma. As for COPD, it's pretty much the opposite in that we have no role for leukotriene modifiers or anti-IG therapy, but reflumilast does play a role and we use it in patients with chronic bronchitis, severe disease and history of exacerbations. 
So um, let's uh, <laughs> try and uh, make some conclusions out of it. And first of all, we do have to stress the, import the importance of non-pharmacological approaches in both diseases and also in the ACO syndrome. Uh, because uh, smoking cessation am among them is the single most important intervention in COPD and asthma smokers. Uh, in general, current treatment of asthma targets inflammation while COPD targets uh, is the treatment of COPD is directed at symptom relief, so bronchodilators are used. As Jeannie said, ACOS patients have characteristics of both. So most of those patients smoke. We have to uh, convince them to stop smoking and both therapies are usually used. Uh, so this is why we have to take into account the differences between etiology and symptoms of the both diseases. So is phenotyping important and does it have any therapeutic and prognostic consequences? Of course, it's important to uh, define which disease does the patient have. Sometimes we can't. Uh, but it's important for treating the disease correctly. And is phenotyping uh, possible? We, <laughs> we uh, stress the, the possibility of it in the first part of our presentation, saying that in most cases we do have tools to distinguish between the two of them, although in some cases that is not possible, and uh, we still have to follow the guidelines in order to uh, understand how to treat those patients. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations, you were great. Now, are there any questions from the audience? No, I have one. I would like to ask you, what if we can't uh, decide if it's more asthma or more COPD? What do you do then? Uh, we follow the guidelines. And Which they are? The the, what are the guidelines? The GINA gold guidelines, which he mentioned okay. in one of the slides, and they, uh, trying to sum up what they say, is that if we have a doubt between the two patients, be, because the patient uh, with asthma has a better prognosis, we pretty much follow the, uh, the asthma procedure, uh, in that we try first with the anti-inflammatory drugs and then use also combination therapy with bronchodilators. Okay. Yes, the, the guidelines are really uh, simple to use. They're actually check boxes for symptoms of both diseases, and you just check uh, which symptoms does the patient have. And after that, you decide what diagnosis is more appropriate. Uh, congratulations also from my, my side. It's a really, very, very in-detail presentation. Uh, if uh, I was the mentor, <laughs> I would rename the title of the presentation. Huh? I, would, uh, I would call the presentation ACUS, Meet Reality or Pharmaceutical Construct? <laughs> because my opinion is that it's the third. Uh, uh, ACUS is, is uh, a diagnosis which uh, is not in international classification of diseases. So it's an artificial, mm -hmm. it's quite artificial disease. And um, uh, you know, uh, in fact, uh, what is the the idea of a pharmaceutical industry, how to increase the, the selling of their drugs. So you know, the COPD is, the, the advanced COPD is treated with a combination of two bronchodilators. Yes. Uh, and in head steroids, in fact, are not very effective in COPD. And uh, the, the, the study showing that in health corticosteroids reduce the exacerbation rate. Yes. Uh, uh, yes, the, the, the studies are uh, compared with placebo. Yeah, but also bronchodilators compared to placebo also decrease the exacerbation rate. Uh, there are no studies, in fact, no well characterized studies, uh, well performed studies comparing combination of bronchodilators to corticosteroids, corticosteroids in decreasing uh, exacerbation rates. Uh, on the other hand, the severe asthma is treated by a combination of steroids and uh, lava. Uh, yeah, so we have three drugs uh, and without ACOS, a patient would, every patient, uh, so patient with asthma would get two, patient with COPD, other two. So mm -hmm. pharmaceutical industry wants to make uh, a population of patients which would need all three drugs <laughs> and that's ACOS. <laughs> okay. 
that's interesting. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Anyone? I would just maybe just ask, uh, maybe I missed it and you already mentioned it. <laughs> but yeah, what is the mean age of the patients we are talking about at, in this ACOS? The age of onset, it, it's earlier than COPD and later than asthma. That's why the diagnosis comes so in handy. Uh, because ACOS patients are user, usually smokers, the diagnosis uh, becomes apparent earlier than in COPD. Uh, the exacerbations are more severe, and uh, I think the mean age is about 40, 50 years. Yes. I don't remember the exact number. I think it was somewhere in the 40s. That's why it's also an overlap syndrome in that also the early symptoms of the disease are not really easy to distinguish. And that asthma usually starts early on and uh, COPD starts later on in life, but that's something in between and you cannot really use that as a criteria to distinguish them in this case. Okay, any more questions? So I mentioned uh, high resolution CT has a very important uh, uh, diagnostic test in those patients who are, let's say, candidates to get an ACOS diagnosis, but uh, it's not important only for, for differentiating asthma from COPD or to, to detect abnormalities of both diseases in a single patient, but also to, to, to perform differential diagnostics because uh, there are more than two diagnoses causing let's say, irreversible or, or, or uh, not completely reversible obstruction. So uh, before, before uh, uh, making uh, a final diagnosis, what is, what, what, what's that patient? It's not typical COPD, it's not typical asthma, yeah, might be ACOS, but maybe uh, uh, chronic bronchiolitis. Maybe he has bronchiectasis, so uh, you shouldn't miss other, other yeah. diagnoses which, which uh, do not fit into, Yet, into uh, CPD. Actually, we, we didn't say that uh, high resolution CT was important in distinguishing between the two because we said both patients, both asthmatic patients and COPD patients might be emphysematic yeah, they patients. They both develop emphysema and I don't think that uh, in Slovenia it's really an option to uh, put every COPD patient to a no, high resolution every CT. Or every, 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 every patient with COPD with uh, a yeah. typical presentation. Yeah, but it's estimated that 15 to 55 percent of COPD patients have ACOS, so that's a large number for our uh, system to digest, I think. Yeah. Uh, the, the real incidence uh, should be about 20% 20, 20 so that are smoking asthmatics. Yeah, that's it. Yes. Because 20% of smokers develop COPD and 20% of smoking asthmatics develop COPD. So that's, that's uh, <coughs> what in fact should be, should be a synonym for ACOS. Okay, last question up there. Yeah, I'll be very short. Uh, you mentioned that in COPD, taking corticosteroids is connected with high risk of pneumonia. But how is it in older asthma patients that are also getting inhaled corticosteroids? Is there also an increased risk of getting pneumonia? Yes, there is. But, um, since the, this kind of therapy, the, the, the therapy for asthmatic patients does improve prognosis in the long run, we still use them. Yes. And we do take the risk of uh, pneumonia. Uh, so there's, there's uh, again, an, an, an another trick in, in that topic. So uh, uh, patients, with, patients with COPD are treated with high dose, extremely high dose of inhaled corticosteroids. Patients with asthma are treated with low dose of mm -hmm. inhaled corticosteroids. So uh, that's why side effects of inhaled corticosteroids are, are more often or always present, presented in COPD patients, but not in majority of asthma patients. Okay, thank you both again. Thank you. And we are moving on to the next debate. Patients with asthma and ischemic heart disease, should we give them beta blockers? 
On the pro side, we have Petra Kurt, Medical Faculty of Ljubljana, and on the contra side, Giovanni Del Fabro from the Medical Faculty of Udine. The mentor is still Dr. Mitya Koshnik. Hi, I'm Giovanni. Hi, I'm Petra. And we are going up, uh, to talk about patients, uh, asthmatic patients, that they have also ischemic heart disease, and if we should give them beta blockers. Uh, the therapy of ischemic heart disease uh, includes also beta, beta blockers, and the therapy, the therapy for asthma, it includes also beta agonists, so two opposite therapies. The question is, what to do when the two diseases come in the same patient. If we should give beta blockers that to solve the ischemic heart disease, but with the risk of develop uh, bronchospasm, of, uh, with the risk of uh, reduce the response of beta agonists. Okay, I will tell you something about beta blockers first. They are indicated in wide range of conditions like arterial hypertension, congestive heart failure, angina pectoris, myocardial infarction, cardiac arrhythmia, and so on. And they are proven to reduce morbidity and mortality in those patients. But because of some possible adverse reactions like bronchospasm, uh, physicians have been avoiding prescribing those drugs for many years to asthma patients. Uh, we have two groups of beta blockers. Uh, one group is non-cardioselective group, and the other one is cardioselective group. And in our body, we also have two types of beta receptors. Beta-1 receptors, which are found mainly in the heart, and beta-2 receptors, which are found also in the lungs. So the word cardioselective, it means that those beta blockers have 20 times higher affinity for beta-1 receptors. So it means heart, heart receptors, and they should have action mainly on the heart. Um, yeah, beta blockers, as the opposite to beta stimulation, cause the decreased heart rate, decreased contractibility of the heart, and also bronchoconstriction. Uh, here we find uh, the main representatives of the two, uh, of the two groups, the cardioselective group and non-cardioselective group. Okay, uh, since the first use of beta blockers for ischemic heart disease is considered a contraindication, uh, the use of beta blockers in asthmatic patients uh, because it comes the high risk of develop bronchospasm. Yeah, but did you know that all that fear prescribing bronco, um, beta blockers to asthma patients uh, is based on clinical reports where asthma patients were receiving high doses of non-cardioselective beta blockers. And maybe we were doing harm to those patients because just like any other patients with ischemic heart disease, also asthma patients could benefit use of beta blockers. But fortunately, our understanding of beta blockers has undergone a remarkable transition in the last 10 to 20 years. And uh, myths have been replaced by evidence-based data, which is great, because today we can say that beta blockers were contraindicated in asthma patients. Are you surprised about that? Well, today we can say that cardioselective beta blockers are safe in some patients with obstructive lung diseases and that those patients may actually benefit use of beta blockers. Okay, it's not true that they were contraindicated because actually the guidelines still say it's contraindicated, relative contraindicated, the use of beta blockers in asthmatic patients. But yeah, let's discuss it. Uh, with these topics, we will talk about these uh, topics, acute and chronic exposure, how it's different, and also how it's different between uh, selective and non selective beta blockers, and how uh, the use of beta blockers change the um, respiratory indexes, and the beta 2 agonist response, and the effect of uh, beta blockers in the acute coronary syndrome and how to select the patients. And last topic, uh, the side effects of beta blockers. Okay, let's see um, how to change the respiratory indexes. Like the flow expiratory volume in the first second, it change, you see there is a decrease, uh, not only for non-selective beta blockers, 
but also for selective beta blockers, there uh, is a decrease of um, the flow expirator expiratory volume in the first second. And yes, that means that there is a respiratory effect uh, by the use of both cardioselective and not selective beta blockers. Yes, but what are the numbers? Is the decrease significant? Yeah, okay, let's see the numbers. The decrease comes for uh, acute exposure, both for no selective and selective beta blockers. Of course, more for no selective beta blockers that they interact more with beta 2 uh, receptors, but also for selective beta blockers. And uh, for chronic exposure, there is two uh, lower uh, uh, flow expiratory volume in the first second, both for non-selective and selective beta blockers. So it's not completely safe, the use of selective beta blockers. Sorry. <laughs> uh, on this figure, you can see that by the use of beta blockers, uh, this is on the general population, not on asthmatics. Um, the flu expiratory volume is decreases, and for continuous users, this uh, decrease it remains stable, but only in, uh, in any case it's lower of not users. And for stoppers, the flu expiratory volume it increases, but it don't reach the same value of not users. Okay, but I, will com I want to comment here on something. 100 milliliters, are you serious? Come on, we are not talking about COPD patients, stage four. We are talking about asthma patients, and their respiratory volumes are quite similar to the general population. So 100 milliliters should not affect their, uh, their state. So um, I think they wouldn't feel it at all. Uh, and Besides, it's not the fill one that actually matters. It's the Tiflo index that measures the airway obstruction. Okay, you're right. But uh, the Tiflo index is decreased too in by chronic exposure in not selective beta blockers. Yes, but you know, to have a, a diagnosis of an obstructive airway disease, uh, the Tiflo index should be below 70%. And 1% up or down, well, it's not that important. And also, okay. In chronic exposure to selective beta blockers, the Tifno index was not affected at all. But, yeah, we know we shouldn't observe only the numbers. Uh, it's the clinical uh, picture that actually matters. So were the, did those patients have any symptoms? Yeah, let's see the results. Uh, the symptom risk is increased by the use of non-selective beta blockers in the acute exposure, and, but is increased also in the selective beta blockers, but yeah, as the result uh, showed, it's not sure because it's not uh, significant, statistically significant, so it's not really sure. Yes, I agree with you. Some patients, but really some patients, can have some symptoms in acute exposure, but on the other side, in, the chronic, expo in chronic exposure to beta blockers, they had no symptom change. So there was no change in asthma control questionnaire filled in, with those in uh, by those patients. Okay, but I want to talk about the change of beta-2 agonist response. Uh, here, for acute exposure of beta blockers, of non-selective, and also uh, selective beta blockers, there is a decrease in the response of beta-2 um, agonist response, and this is means that the bronchodilating effect is lower after the use of beta blockers, not only for non-selective beta blockers, that they don't reach the main baseline uh, of before the use of beta blockers, but also for selective, of course, is less the impairment of bronchodilating effect, but still there is this effect, and this is uh, quite dangerous because if we give beta blockers to a p asthmatic patients and it develops a bronchospasm, and then we are not able to solve it with the beta-2 response, beta-2 agonist response, of course this could impair the prognosis of the patients. So we can't give safely beta blockers. Uh, by chronic exposure, 
the impairment of bronchodilating effect is was shown to. Okay, I agree with everything you said, and this uh, uh, decreased response to beta two agonists really seems to be important. But in chronic exposure to beta two uh, beta blockers, the uh, beta two agonist response was not affected at all, and even more, there was a nine percent increase in the response. To, uh, after the use of beta blockers compared to placebo. So uh, this actually implies that patients would actually benefit beta blocker use. Are you sure? <laughs> yes, yeah, sure. Are we <laughs> speaking about benefits of use of beta blockers in asthmatic patients that could cause bronchospasm? Yes, yeah. let's see it closer. Yes, Have you heard? <laughs> yeah. Have you heard uh, of the paradox effect uh, of use of beta blockers in congestive heart failure? Well, the same has been now uh, has been predisposed, proposed for asthma patients. So let's take a closer look of it. Uh, beta adrenal receptors are said to have a very sensitive negative feedback mechanism. It means that uh, when we use beta blockers, uh, they cause uh, upregulation and sensitization of beta receptors. And uh, the receptors, that's, uh, that's why receptors uh, become more sensitive to beta-2 agonists. And when we administer later beta-2 agonist drugs, uh, it comes to increased response to beta-2 uh, agonists. So it comes to the paradoxical effect uh, I explained uh, like, uh, before, to the increase to the beta-2 agonist response. And the same has been now questioned uh, for asthma patients. Uh, we, we, we know that beta blockers can have some uh, acute deleterious effect in congestive heart failure patients, but they are proven they are so um, they are so beneficial in chronic use, and uh, because they uh, increase ejection fraction and decrease morbidity and mortality in those patients. And today they are part of standard therapy in congestive heart failure, and. Uh, yeah, in asthma patients, we, we know, Giovanni showed us numbers, uh, beta blockers could have some acute deleterious effect, but we would like to, to know if they also have, could have some beneficial uh, effect in chronic use. Uh, and this has been even more important now that it's been proven that uh, chronic use of beta-2 agonists in asthma uh, leads to, uh, to worse uh, asthma control because uh, of beta, receptor, beta 2 receptor downregulation and desensitization. And yeah, beta blockers could really be, maybe, could really be beneficial in causing just the opposite effect as expected in chronic use, which is, which is great. Okay, I would like to remark that the potential benefits of beta blockers may only be seen following chronic exposure. And we already saw that the acute exposure uh, produces an uh, increase of symptoms, a uh, decrease of flow expiratory volume index, and a uh, decrease in the tifino index, and a um, decrease in beta-2 agonist response. So it's, it's, yeah, before we have to initiate the therapy to, to become co chronic, and so before the patient have to be able to tolerate the acute exposition, and it seems it's not so easy. You're, you're right, I agree with you, but in acute situations like acute coronary syndrome, there's actually no time. Patients should be administered beta blockers in 24 hours after admission to the hospital because they're proven to reduce in-hospital mortality. Uh, here we, we can see the numbers. Uh, patients with reactive airway diseases, so it means asthma patients and COPD patients with reactive component, uh, are much less likely to receive beta blockers on admission or discharge uh, compared to patients with no history of reactive airway diseases. And the result is that patients with reactive airway diseases and acute coronary syndrome are 20% more likely to die in the hospital than patients with non -cor coronary artery disease risk factors, which is really sad. Yeah, okay. I think also it's quite normal because in patients that have asthma or other comorbidities is more difficult to identify the symptoms of acute coronary syndrome. And of course, this is the main explanation, I think, for the delayed treatment. Okay, but I think that in acute, acute coronary syndrome, only the survival outcome matters. And 
The meta-analysis uh, have shown that mild to moderate asthmatics can safely receive beta blockers, so they should get beta blockers. Yeah, that's nice, but before, uh, uh, yes, of course, in a acute setting, like when it happens acute coronary syndrome, it's difficult that you have the time to select the patients and say, yeah, you are mild asthma, you are severe asthma, if they have no pre diagnosed asthma. And so I think the best way, the more sure way, is give calcium antagonists, that's what they say the actually guidelines, to patients that they can receive safely beta blockers, like asthmatic patients. And then perhaps when you have time, you give uh, beta blockers to mild and moderate asthmatics. This is more safe. Okay, fortunately or unfortunately, many patients really receive calcium antagonists, but they are not as potent drug as beta blockers are. And in my opinion, the best time to initiate with beta blocker therapy is in the hospitals, where patients can be closely monitored, and in case something really goes wrong, there's stuff to help. Uh, and also data shows that if patients are not given beta blocker therapy uh, in the hospitals, they're also not likely to receive, to receive that therapy in the outpatient clinic. So uh, if they don't get beta blocker therapy in the hospitals, they will never get it. And they, they do reduce morbidity and mortality. Uh, that's true, but uh, there are also only few data regarding uh, the use of beta blockers in patients that have uh, reactive airway diseases. So it's really a risk that you take if you, if you start to give beta blockers to asthmatic patients. And yeah, we, we really don't know what could happen. Um, I want also to speak about um, a study that um, wanted to studied the safety and the effects of beta blockers, like nadolol, that is no selective beta, uh, beta blocker, in patients with mild asthma. And I want to speak about that because it's uh, an example of uh, how it's difficult to select the patients. Okay, in this study, the selection uh, it was really uh, severe, and we can say the asthmatic where uh, patients were really liked asthmatics, uh, young, between 18 and 50 years old, no smokers with a good uh, flow expiratory volume, <laughs> and excluded for any significant health issues and for any asthma exacerbation in the last period before the beginning of the study. Okay, let's see the results. Yes, you can see that 80% of patients improved their metacoline test, so the, their error hyperresponsiveness decreased, which is great. 80%, it's really a big number. Okay, like always, you see only the good part, but on the left, you see that 20%, they had a decrease. They were the same people, I mean, the same selected people, and they had a decrease in their um, flow expiratory volume in the first second after the use of beta blockers, and at the same time, the people, it was the same that at the lowest dose of these beta blockers. So, yeah, the question is if we are able to uh, select the patients that can receive the beta blockers safely. Yes, but you chose a, st a study with Nadolol. It's a non cardio selective beta blocker. I'm quite sure the results would be better, even better, with se cardio selective beta blocker. And also, only 10 people in a study. Well, we cannot make any conclusions. It's not a good study. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, we can say, yeah, we don't know uh, what happens by uh, uh, selective beta blockers. Okay, this is for no selective. And, but in any case, we don't know uh, why it develop this uh, adverse reaction. And probably there are six susceptible patients, but we don't know how to recognize. So. We need further studies to see if there is uh, some genetic polymorphism or s something else. Yes, I agree with you. We would like to know which asthma patients could really safely be administered beta blocker. So it's important to get more studies. Okay, last point, side effects. Uh, beta blockers give a lot of uh, side effects. Uh, yeah, we already talked about bronchospasm. 
of course, that is high risk in asthmatic patients. Of course, they give also bradycardia and uh, atrioventricular block and other side effects. But I want to talk especially about diabetes because um, yeah, the use of beta blockers is shown uh, to be associated with uh, increased risk of diabetes. But at the same time, uh, the population of asthmatics it seems to be associated with a high risk of developed diabetes. So the two things together, asthmatic and use of beta blockers, could give a really high risk of developed diabetes. And another side effect that could occur is uh, adverse reaction to beta blockers. This, uh, there is a clinical fall of an old woman of 70 years old that develop angioedema, and this, this is a really life-treating condition. That's, yeah, it's really, uh, yeah, it's really dangerous condition, and yeah, okay. we should think about that. But you know, every medicine has side effects. Every medicine can have some adverse reactions, and we will never be able to predict them. Uh, and yeah. Uh, also, beta blockers um, are known to predispose patients to, to new onset of diabetes, so uh, it's nothing new. Uh, it's not a new, new thing. Uh, and, but I think we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't uh, be afraid of prescribing beta blockers too much. We should do it carefully, uh, but they do have, they are very beneficial, so if patients need that, those medications, they should get them. Okay, uh, this time I agree with you, and yeah, okay, so let's see who could receive safely beta blockers, and yeah, because it's not just for contra, but we should uh, uh, say which patients could uh, benefit of beta blockers, also if asthmatics. Okay. The data shows that mild to moderate asthmatics with cardiovascular comorbidities are, can safely be administered beta blockers, but... They have to be really well controlled asthmatics and better if they are under uh, inhalated corticosteroids and uh, also better if, uh, especially at the beginning of the therapy with beta blockers, we give theotropium, that is a long... Uh, un acting uh, antagonist uh, anti-muscarinic uh, uh, agent that avoid the bronchospasm. Yes, and beta blockers that we should give those patients should be selective beta blockers. Yeah, and to avoid the um, uh, adverse reaction, um, we should give the lowest dose as possible and then uh, increase the doses gradually and reach the highly doses uh, without adverse reaction. Yes, and also, for example, in asthma patient with hypertension, beta blockers should not be the first line therapy. So also some logic needs to be used. Okay. Okay. That's everything from our side. I hope you learned something new. Thank you very much. We are a bit late, so the debate will be quick. Any questions? Uh, hello. Uh, so uh, it's a fact that uh, beta-1 blockers have also some beta-2 effects and vice versa. So uh, why not, if we have a patient with uh, chronic heart failure with asthma, why not just avoid the problem altogether and use other drugs that are proven to reduce morbidity and mortality, like AC inhibitors, uh, sartans, or uh, aldosterone inhibitors, and so on? Why, why even consider beta blockers? Yeah, but beta blockers uh, are proven to reduce mortality and morbidity in those patients, and they're also proven to be safe in mild to moderate asthma, so why wouldn't you give a patient a beta blocker? Because it may have some asthmatic effect while the AC inhibitors or the angiotensin inhibitors. Yes, but those patients should get all those drugs. <laughs> yeah, actually, it's what happens is what you say. Uh, they give other drugs, but yeah, it's the thing if, uh, if we want to see if uh, there is a uh, um, more decrease of mortality, it seems to be a more decrease of mortality using beta blockers in the mild and uh, moderate asthmatics. 
So it's, it's better use beta blockers in these patients. It's, it's a survival outcome is better. Okay, thank you. Okay, maybe the mentor would like to say something. Okay, so um, oh, there are case reports, yeah, that's pushing us as back and um, the study you showed, uh, large studies, American studies, uh, with patients with react to airway disease. Uh, it should, should be stressed that uh, in those studies, patients with COPD and asthma were mixed together. Uh, patients with COPD are not, let's say, uh, do, do, do not adversely react to, to better blockers. So, so uh, that poor selection of patients might give us, uh, let's say, a better feeling of, uh, of safety. Uh, that's it. Uh, you know, as a joke, what's the what's, uh, major difference between cardiologists and pneumologists? Uh, the pneumologists know much about heart. <laughs> so uh, um, uh, all those uh, old studies, in fact, mix COPD and asthma, asthma together. Uh, what is good? Uh, all those uh, old studies, uh, including patients with asthma, were made um, uh, on asthma patients without corticosteroid treatment because uh, corticosteroids were introduced in asthma treatment about 15 years ago on a uh, large scale and those case reports are all very old. Uh, maybe just to conclude, uh, you showed that two out of 10 asthma patients reacted uh, with uh, deterioration, eight reacted with no deterioration or even some improvement of asthma and <coughs> those uh, those two, in fact, uh, are, are important not to, not to miss. Uh, what do we see? Some case reports. So older patients with extremely mild asthma, undiagnosed asthma, uh, after uh, myocardial infarction, they get beta blocker, and uh, the asthma manifests first time in life when they get a beta blocker mm -hmm. for appropriate indication uh, of uh, ischemic heart disease. Thanks. Okay, we will have one last break.
Take your seats. Final session's topic is palliative care. And the, well, palliative care is the best care possible for the end of life. Could anyone argue contra? I invite both of the speakers, Tomislav Felbabic and Daniel Kosciuta, both from medical faculty of Ljubljana and their mentor, Matthias Figel, uh, from Hospital Nova Gorica. Applaus. The stage is yours. Thank you. So, hello everybody. Um, for this last session, we will have something special for you. Um, it won't be a typical parade contra debate. Me and my colleague uh, Tommy Slau are going to talk to you about palliative care, uh, what it is and who should get it and when. And then we will speak about the end of life with uh, withdrawing and withholding treatment on one side and euthanasia on the other side. So in a way, we will both be representing the pro side of the debate. Uh, when we're done with the presentation, we would like you as an audience to ask questions, share doubts, or just to comment about a topic. So in a way, you will be representing the contra side. Uh, there will be no right or wrong. The main point is to get the debate going. So uh, let's get started. Okay, when, um, yeah. when a person with a life-threatening disease uh, comes to us, doctors, and usually they want to know how long do they have. Uh, but actually, what they are asking for is also about the progress of the disease, what will happen. And to answer these questions, we can help ourselves with those illness trajectories. Basically, there are four uh, ways a person can die. Number one, because of sudden death, like for instance in a car accident. Uh, the second possibility is within a short period of, of time with an evident decline, like for instance in an aggressive cancer. The third option or third um, possibility is with long-term limitations and uh, intermittent exacerbations, like in organ failure. And the last, fourth um, way of dying, I would say, is with prolonged dwindling, like in dementia. And epidemiologic studies have shown that just 7% of us will die all of a sudden, which means that all the others will die within some months to years, and they will require palliative care. But to make things easier to understand, let us take a patient out of those 90 plus percent. It is an 82 years old gentleman with chronic heart failure and other comorbidities. Uh, he was doing fine in the last years, but he had three acute exacerbations during the last year, and now he's classified as New York Heart Association Class 4, which means that he has severe limitations and he's symptomatic also at rest. So I would like to ask you now, dear colleagues, uh, do you think he does deserve palliative treatment? Yes. Yeah, nice. I agree too. But uh, what can we offer him and all those patients, Tomislav? An excellent question, Daniel. Uh, so as you have said, we can offer, him, offer them palliative care, which is an approach. Its intention is to make the quality of the remaining life as best as possible for both patient and uh, his relatives. Uh, palliative care uh, requires a team approach. Uh, a palliative care uh, reduces the psychosocial distress. It uh, reduces also physical uh, distress and helps with other spiritual problems. Uh, it is done by the uh, palliative team, which uh, is uh, composed out of the core team, physician, nurse, social worker, patient and uh, relatives if they are involved in the decision-making process. Uh, also other uh, medical staff may jump in if needed. This is an interdisciplinary team which means that all uh, the members of the team aim to help the patient. 
So uh, we have to remember that dying, death, is a normal natural process. It, uh, palliative care does not hasten or postpone death. It just makes the quality of the remaining life as best as possible. Okay, so when talking about, about palliative care, it is a very key point, communication between physician and patients and between phys physician and patient's family. Uh, a lot of studies has been done to determine the best way to communicate uh, with such patients. First of all, we should get rid of language barriers and use the language they are most comfortable with. Uh, we should start, we should um, determine a, their level of knowledge to set a starting point for the later discussion. And we should communicate bad news in a sensitive manner at a pace that suits the patient we have in front of us. Because some of them will get everything at first, others will uh, need some time to digest all the information. Obviously, they will react very differently, but usually they will go through some phases which are denial, anger, guilt, and blame. Mm -hmm. well, when talking to patients, we must keep in mind that truth may hurt, but deceit hurts more. Uh, patients will need support, especially psychological one, not to give up. They will need to find hope in every kind of situation, since it's proven that it reduces the uh, psychosocial distress, it enhances the well-being, and uh, in the end, the quality of life. Uh, we must also remember that observing the process of dying may differ between the patient and the physician. That's why the priorities may also differ. This table is an example of that, and we can see that some priorities are equally important for both patient and the physician, like pain symptom management, preparation of death, and so on, while others, uh, like uh, religious reasons, uh, awareness, or funeral arrangements, are equally important for the patient, but not as important for the physician. When talking about palliative care, um, there is always this question, when to start it? So I would once again ask you, what do you think? Uh, should we start palliative treatment in the last week of a patient's life? In the last month or early before? Who would say early before? Nice. Um, I agree too. But sometimes it's uh, quite hard to determine when uh, to do it. Usually we should start it with when we have a patient with chronic and curable disease who is suffering. As I said, it is quite hard to determine when exactly to start and to uh, help us, we have a screening question. Will we be surprised if the person in front of us will die within one year? If the answer is yes, then he or she probably uh, need palliative treatment. Obviously, um, at the beginning, the focus should be on curative care, but then as uh, the illness progresses, palliative care should gain on importance and actually it should be carried on also after patient's death because, because the, palliative uh, the palliative team should take care of the family of their uh, possible problems, uh, physical, psychological, least speaking. Uh, so today's approach of palliative team is not any more paternalistic. Uh, patients should be involved in the decision-making process because that makes them autonomous and they can decide from themselves. Uh, all the decisions taken during the uh, palliative care should be based on three principles. Autonomy, non-maleficence, beneficence, and justice. These must be kept in mind especially when, when we have to decide about withholding or withdrawing specific therapeutic treatment. Uh, we must also ask ourselves if is the uh, treatment going to help the patient? Is the treatment potentially harmful and to what extent? And is it accessible to anyone? So the decision should be made based on the answers to those questions. To respect um, basically the first and the second principles where Tomislav presented you, um, we should involve patients in the decision making process. And this is called shared decision making, where patients, families, and physicians, or better, the palliative team, uh, decide together what to do. 
obviously we have to inform the patients and um, let them decide which treatments do they want and which treatments do they refuse. This advanced planning is called advanced care planning. If we uh, take our patient, um, this, with, this patient with chronic heart failure, he uh, decided after uh, a discussion with the physician and uh, his family that he would not like to have mechanical ventilation in case he would be uh, severely dyspnoic. And once the patient decides this, the physician has the moral duty to do as the patient wants. Now let's take another problem in palliative care. Um, those are patients in intensive care units. Those patients are unable to make decisions because they are intubated, sedated. So how should we solve this problem? Basically, we can have three options. Number one, doctors can decide uh, for the patient based on their own experiences. Number two, we can involve their relatives and families and who hopefully will help us to respect patients' wills. And number three, we can base our decisions upon the living will. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the first one is obviously out of discussion because of the clear ethical reasons, while the other two are uh, both possible and are both used. There are big variations between countries, legally speaking. For example, some countries make the living will binding for the physician, like for example, USA or UK. Uh, some countries make the living will just one of the factors that have to be taken under consideration when making the decision, like for example, in Netherlands. And some countries don't even take it under consideration, like for example, in Italy. Now, when talking about palliative medicine, we must also mention a thing or two about euthanasia, which has been a particularly popular thing this past few months in Slovenia. So, uh, euthanasia is a practice of intentionally ending life uh, in order to relieve pain and suffering. It is done by a physician who administers a lethal dose of some drug so the patient can die peacefully. There's also a similar thing to euthanasia called physician-assisted suicide which means that the doctor leaves the lethal dose of some drug near patient so the patient can administer it uh, to himself and thus committing suicide. Uh, these both two options are not allowed in uh, most countries. So let's get back to our patient. So uh, one day he is admitted to the emergency department because of the uh, acute exaberation of his heart failure. He knew it would happen eventually and he has decided he does not want any aggressive treatment. So if he does not want any life prolonging treatment, uh, what do we do? Do you guys think that not treating a patient is basically the same as euthanasia? How many would say yes? How many would say no? Nice. nice. I totally agree with you because uh, withholding and withdrawing treatment is not euthanasia. In this case, a competent person decides what treatments do they accept and what treatments do they refuse. And usually, we are speaking here about treatments that basically just prolong the dying process because uh, they are very burdensome for the patient with little of no benefit for him or her. And this, um, I'm sorry, and uh, this withholding and withdrawing life-sustaining treatments is basically uh, done on a daily basis uh, in all the hospitals, mainly obviously in intensive care units and other places where we treat a very sick and uh, critical patients. Uh, so uh, we have to remember that withholding or withdrawing specific therapeutic treatment is, does not mean to stop with all the treatments. It means to stop with those treatments whose main point is to prolong life. Like for example, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, hemodialysis, severe antibiotic treatment, and so on. Uh, those treatments which are used to uh, re relieve suffering, like painkillers, sedatives, oxygen, even giving small sips of cold water just to keep mouth uh, wet, 
can still be administered. Uh, even though, strictly speaking, when food and water need to be administered with uh, medical assistance, uh, fall under the category of life prolonging treatment, they can still be used if the patient wishes so. Although it may not be such a good idea because studies have shown that giving fluids to terminally ill patients uh, can cause pulmonary edema or hepatomegaly uh, and which can cause abdominal pain. So uh, it would be best if we stop with the nutrition altogether. It may seem like a non-humane thing to do, but uh, it was shown that with the right nursing, there is practically no suffering. So the Hippocratic Oath states that we as physicians should, should preserve life. But on the, other, on, the, on the other side, we should also take care of patients' autonomy. So is it ethical to stop those treatments? Um, obviously, overruling a competent uh, rational refusal of a patient is basically depriving him of freedom. But first of all, physicians have to make clear that this is a rational decision. And they have to make clear that maybe th that this uh, patient decision is not based upon, let's say, a treatable uh, depression or suffering, because those conditions can be treated. If it is a rational um, decision patients have made, then it is absolutely clear and without any doubt that it's morally unacceptable for a doctor to administer them life prolonging treatments. So, uh, in summary, palliative medicine is becoming more and more important in today's medical field. It is meant for those patients with chronic incurable diseases uh, who are suffering. It's important because life expectancy of uh, humans is increasing and that's why more and more people have more and more chronic illnesses. Uh, as we have said earlier, uh, more than 90% of us will not die instantly but will perish slowly and that's why uh, all of those people will need palliative care. It should be started as soon as the diagnosis is made, but uh, true in the early stages of the disease, curative medicine should play a major part. And then as the disease progresses, so does the role of palliative medicine. We have seen that palliative care is not just the treatment of a dying patient. It's much more than that. It's based on advanced care planning and shared decision making, and it aims to enhance quality of life of those patients while respecting ethical principles. So uh, we have concluded our presentation. Now it's time for questions and for your opinions and thoughts. But maybe let's start with some questions from our side to you, or to say it better, some dilemmas. So we have a 69-year-old patient with an end-stage COPD who is no longer capable of completing everyday tasks. He has made an advanced care plan with his personal doctor, and he does not want to be put on a respirator. He just wants symptomatic treatment. He hasn't filled the living will yet. But, and because of this uh, severe progress progression, we are called to a home visit. Will we respect his undocumented wish and offer him only palliative care? Who would um, respect it and who wouldn't and why? Any takers? Can you repeat the question?
Mm -hmm. I mean, which exactly is the dilemma? That somebody will say uh, that maybe the patient wants it differently, but who would be that? The family members or whom? Hmm. Uh, when we try to make advanced care planning, plan, uh, we should uh, take in discussion uh, not just patient, but also, also family numbers, members. And um, what uh, altogether decide, then the family will know when the patient needs to be intubated, let's say, and can speak for themselves. family would not know what the patient wanted or what? Because if the doctor knows what the no, patient no, no, just, wanted... Uh, you have uh, written the advanced care plan, where it's written that the patient uh, uh, don't want... Uh, yeah, but this patient no. hasn't filled anything or I have understood... Yeah, yeah, no, this patient, uh, this patient has only said to his doctor he does not want mm -hmm. any specific treatment but he hasn't signed anything yet. So what do we do with yeah. Probably we have two possibilities here. One is advanced care planning and one is advanced directive. Uh, advanced directive is um, a paper legally written uh, uh, with patient, um, physician, and, um, and a lawyer. A lawyer? Yeah, a uh, And then uh, signed by um, uh, basically uh, there is Maya. Yeah. Uh, there is this um, distinction between living will and advanced uh, care plan. The advanced care plan is uh, something that is something that um, the patient and the family and the physician decide, and the, the, the palliative, the palliative uh, team. On the other side, we have the living will, which is a legal document. And we have something here, or we have... Yes. The, the living, uh, we don't have the living will. And the living will is binding for us, legally speaking, right? Mm -hmm. If we have advanced directive, it's legally binding. If we, has, if we have advanced care plan, then we are just morally obligated to um, do the things. If we don't have anything, like we have uh, advanced care plan. So we have it. Yes. So where is the dilemma? That we don't have advanced, advanced directive. Advanced directive is a legal document. Which Yes. Yeah. Basically, it's this: you come come to this home and you see that this patient is this noic. You assess that he would absolutely need um, intubation because otherwise he will not be able to to breathe anymore. Do you intubate him or do you leave him without intubation? You and um, he know you know that his wish is to uh, be symptomatic treated, but you, have not, you, you don't have the living will that binds you legally. So that is actually basically the question of our moral yeah, view. Yeah. And yeah. I, in that case, it's hard to say because I, was, I haven't been in that situation, but I would try to do it. My moral would be to respect the patient's will, so not to treat him. So yeah, there's no right or wrong. We just want to hear your comments. Me, for example, if uh, I were in a situation like this, and if, uh, there, if my only proof that this, I don't know this patient, and my only proof that he does not want palliative care is his family members telling that to me. And if I don't treat it, and that proves to be wrong, then I'm, I'm in serious trouble. But if I do treat it, and that proves to be right, then I'm also in some kind of trouble, but not as severe as I would, I would have been if I hadn't treated the patient who hasn't 
Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, Yeah, that's and that's, I, I guess that's the trouble we're always talking about because it's then in the end it's the law we're talking about and if we get sued or not mm -hmm. and then we're making, our, we're making our thoughts about ourselves and not about the patient anymore. Yeah. Uh, may I add something? Uh, uh, we have an uh, advanced directive which is legally binding. Uh, there I think it's not a problem that everyone uh, will give just palliative care for this patient. But the problem of advanced directive is that it's um, not used very often. In our country, just less than 10 cases per year. So it's not something that actually lives. Uh, uh, and it's also uh, in other countries like that, like in America, it's USA, uh, 15 to 20 uh, percent uh, right advanced directive. But more of them write advanced care plan, which is just uh, morally binding. And uh, what uh, this country show us that uh, uh, health healthcare professionals um, usually respect those wishes. Uh, in around in uh, USA, in around 99%. So we don't have uh, to have just uh, what is uh, legally binding, but uh, uh, what morally binds us is also good uh, for decision making. Any more comments? Or you can also make up your own problem and we can discuss it. That's the point. If not... Go on. Oops. Okay, so 23-year-old patient has been uh, chronic... No, we have something. We have oh, something. sorry, sorry. Uh, my question would be regarding the first example of 82 years old uh, male with uh, class 4 uh, heart failure. So, um, would in case of exacerbation, would it make sense to hospitalize him to the specialized institution or would it be more appropriate to treat him, uh, let's say, in, in the, um, how is it called? At home. Yeah, yeah, at home, or, or at the palliative center. Uh, a hospice or something. Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. If I would take this patient, uh, let's say, uh, in the emergency department, uh, and if he doesn't want to be intubated and he does not want aggressive treatment, then I see no point to refer him to an ICU unit. If you yes. uh, when we're trying to make advanced care plan, uh, then we try to uh, discuss also where the patient wants to have, have uh, care and uh, where the patient wants to die. Uh, the statistics is saying that uh, around 80 to 90 percent wants to die at home, uh, the, and only the small part in hospitals. So, uh, if we have written in the advanced directive that uh, or advanced care plan that the patient wants to will have uh, the care at home, uh, we are trying. We will try to give them at home. Okay, so we have a 23-year-old patient who has been in chronic vegetative state for six months after a car crash. Uh, how do we proceed? I would first ask, does, uh, does he have something, anything, an advanced? No, uh, no. It's a young will. patient, hasn't even thought about dying yet, and he has been in a terrible car crash, and this happens. Sorry, what do, what do, uh, what do his relatives say? Yes, we, we should ask them, and uh, try to include them in shared decision making. And That's so the right way uh, for uh, this dilemma. 
And so if they are for turning off all the devices that support him, um, is it okay if we turn them off and let him die? Uh, are the adult people uh, allowed to take decision for adult patient or no? We as adults uh, can make decision for children, but not for adult patients. Uh, this is ethically not allowed. Um, what uh, the relatives can do uh, is uh, try to imagine what the patient will decide in this situation. Uh, the relatives know the patient and uh, they're trying to find out if uh, the patient wants to continue with uh, life-sustaining treatment or uh, if he will be able to speak, uh, can be able to speak, uh, will decide uh, not to continue with uh, life-sustaining treatment. So uh, this is called uh, a substitute judgment. Uh, if we have this substitute judgment, then uh, we can do uh, what the patient uh, would want. Uh, If adults are not supposed to take decisions for adults, it doesn't matter if you ask a relative or, I don't know, a partner who is not legally bounded. I don't know, it's not married to the person, mm -hmm. but it's like living with him or her. It's the same if it's a relative or just a friend. Yes. Or, okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, was any um, uh, were there any diagnostic procedures on the state of his brains, hemispheres? Uh, for this patient, yes. yes normally we we do that. Yeah. Could, could if you? if we uh, found out that his brain death, then that there is not a problem. We can uh, discontinue life sustaining treatment, but in. Uh, we have a vegetative state. Normally, we have some some uh, uh, reaction. Um, sorry, can I yeah. comment? Um, as far as I'm, I mean, as far as we're all, all concerned, vegetative state is not the same as brain death, is it? It's not the same. Vegetative state is not as the same death. as being brain no. dead. No. And um, I think a lot of countries um, take one year after a traumatic brain injury to define something as persistent vegetative mm -hmm. state. Uh, and uh, I know very, uh, there are a lot of famous cases, uh, especially in America, when euthanasia was just starting and assisted suicide and withdrawal of um, treatment, uh, where patients like this were treated, I mean, the, you know, the, say, the saline drip was stopped and the artificial nutrition was stopped. And you said that um, it's not really inhumane because it doesn't uh, cause them suffering. But I don't understand, I mean, Taking, you know, allowing somebody to die from dehydration and lack of nutrition sounds incredibly inhumane to me. Yeah, that's, I mean, you're, you're allowed to have that point of view, but it, you know, it's been proven scientifically that with the right nursing, there is practically no suffering. Okay, uh, you got me there. I, I have no idea how it was proven, but uh, maybe... Uh, yes, uh, a lot of studies were made uh, and that um, uh, dehydration and no food uh, intake uh, was at the end of life uh, bounded with uh, any suffering, uh, but it can possibly be if we uh, continue with the rehydration and food uh, by medical assistance, uh, then uh, sometimes we have more pain, uh, more terminal um, death rattle. If we're sure he'll die, isn't it then more humane for the patient, not for us, to just kill him there and mm -hmm. then without just causing him, you know, to take time?
time and die from uh, dehydration. Then again, we're making decision for ourselves to make it easier for ourselves, not the patients. Yeah, but if we take um, the decision not to continue with life-sustaining treatment, let's say no, no antibiotic, no. Uh, but hydration, I think it proved kind of that it's not that you don't suffer thirst um, as long as you put some water in the mouth and that this is actually done and so there's no feeling of thirst in the patient. So as I hear of it that they kind of proved this, that there's no real thirst when you put water in the mouth or some lemon mm -hmm. water and it's not really giving them water so they don't have the feeling of being thirsty anymore yes. in the patient. Uh, Studies so it's not suffering, so as I understood it, maybe, yeah. as I'm not... Studies were done yeah. not in uh, patients with vegetative state, but, all, but uh, for patients at the end of their lives. Um, uh, not uh, taking hydration was not associated with uh, feeling of thirsty. Uh, it, uh, the feeling of uh, first, first uh, was associated with uh, uh, no uh, sips of water in the mouth. Uh, I think that we are kind of talking about two, two separate groups of patients. You are talking about patients in vegetative states, um, and that's maybe a little bit different if we compare them to patients yeah. in intensive care units with vasopressors and all stuff yeah. and we withdraw them. I think there is not a problem just to stop with um, hydration and food. Uh, this is not, it's not possible to stop this and to give antibiotics and to give ventilatory support and hemodialysis. Uh, when we end when we end with uh, life-sustaining life treatment, then we know that the patient will die. Why then prolong dying process with hydration? It's no, I mean, I understand your point. It's just that we know he'll die, or he or she will die. And we're just waiting. We're giving them time. We don't know how long it will take. You know, and it's just we, you know, take off all the treatment there is and then we wait for them to die and instead of, you know, we could, I know it would be active euthanasia to give them something to die in the moment and it's different passive and active euthanasia, but isn't it better for the patient not to have, you know, if we're definitely sure he'll die, you know, and we wait for a few hours or a few days for him to die or just kill him in that moment. I'm just talking about the vegetative state. So Maria, you are actually talking, having in mind that euthanasia would be a better choice. And a I'm just talking about this certain case yeah, in yeah, yeah. vegetative but states. I'm not so generally your point for is actually about euthanasia, that it would be a better choice in your opinion. Am I getting yeah, it in, right? In vegetative state, to me, it seems yeah. okay. better than withdrawing all treatment and being sure uh, the person will die. I didn't understand you. Uh, you said that it's better euthanasia than uh, stopping life-sustaining treatment in this case. In this case, if we're certain the person will die in a few hours or in a few days after we stop all the treatment which is sustaining him or her, then yeah. Mm -hmm. Can we even speak about suffering and well-being of a person who is in a chronic uh, vegetative state? Does he feel anything? Or, uh, we don't know. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, we don't know if they feel pain. Uh, so, um, because maybe they feel uh, they're in pain, uh, we give such a patient uh, painkillers uh, always. Yeah. But the, the problem here is that um, uh, this vegetative state, vegetative state is uh, very uncertain. We don't know how long does it last. We don't, long, we don't know uh, if the patient will awake after a few years. And uh, so because of this uncertainty, uh, then all we have in our hands is to make shared decision what the patient uh, will want. 
uh, will accept this, uh, this little chances of uh, awakening after five years. If this is such a person, then we'll continue to, to sustain uh, this person alive. If uh, it's a person that don't want to take those, this risk of long staying in vegetative state, uh, then it's probably for this person best to uh, stop with life-sustaining treatment. Yes, then we should withdraw the treatment, I think. Uh, the question here, as far as I understand, was to whether, whether it's better to withdraw treatment or to do active euthanasia. And it might, it might not be such a difference for the patient, but I think that from a physician's perspective, it's a really, really big difference. Uh, I mean, you know, it goes against to do active euthanasia. It goes against all principle of primum non nocere. It goes uh, Hippocratic oath. Not treating someone is very different from killing someone. And I mean, if I was in this position, I would definitely not be okay with, you know, administering anything that would actively shorten someone's life. Uh, whether I don't... I wouldn't feel that way just to remove uh, may maybe, you know, tubus or, or to stop uh, nasogastric feeding or whatever. Don't you think that not feeding the patient is harming the patient? Well, it's not yeah. I know, I know what you mean and I, I don't know if I would be able to do active, I probably wouldn't be able to do active euthanasia on anyone, uh, you know, I couldn't live with it probably. but. I think that you're still, you know, you're, if you're absolutely sure, certain that die, they'll die, then there is a big difference for the patient as well. Especially because we don't know if they're in vegetative state, whether they feel it or whether they don't, and what it's like for them. <coughs> I know we'll never agree, so that's why it's a fun discussion. <laughs> uh, the palliative care is the care for end of life, and uh, it should be... Uh, patient and family orientated, not uh, disease orientated. So we, we should take the patient as a whole person and, and to give the care to this whole person. Uh, so uh, we have um, to, we need to, we, we have to include uh, the person and the family uh, in decision making if we want to have uh, patient and family oriented uh, care. Uh, I understand your dilemma about uh, hydration. Uh, this is the question of what is the basic care. So palliative care is the basic care, so we have to uh, relieve the suffering, we have to um, turn the patient around, we have to see some sips of water in the in the mouth. Um, uh, some cultures, some people understand basic care also uh, hydration and food by medical assistant. And for these people, uh, we have to um, give the hydration and the food because. We are family oriented, patient oriented. They want this, so we have to provide the hydration and the food. If the patient don't want, then we don't need to. Yeah, but if the patient uh, wants the hydration, then we will give them. Yeah. And maybe we have one other question. Um, the pap the, so the, pap the legal paper where we can decide, you know, what we would like in the case that something bad happens to us, for example, a vegetative state or when we are older, older the um, chronic disease. Uh, yeah, where can we make this? Like, can we go to our physicians and 
complete um, yes. form and that is then um, like legally uh, legal thing that every phys physician that will take care of us has to consider. So where can we do this? That's my question. Uh, at family physician? Yeah. We can take the formula from internet page of um, Ministry of Health uh, to write down the things, sign uh, the paper, uh, the patient, the physician, and uh, actually, yeah, and then go to the legal office. Where yes, yeah. we make it official. Okay, yes. thank you. Uh, any more questions? Uh, do we have time for the last example, Chairman? <laughs> Otherwise, I don't know. Uh, any other question for now, for these two, from the public? No? You go. No. 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 Should we go for the last one, or? I think we're over time a bit, so okay. you're welcome. Ah. Okay, I would like to thank both the mentor and the presenters for the excellent finish of our Congress. Our applause. <laughs> the others who the other thing is that also all of you who are sitting in public deserve also an applause for staying with us the whole time until this time now. <laughs> we will now continue with some uh, awards giving and gifts and later on we'll finish with closing remarks so please stay somewhere around <laughs> in the Sara, yeah. yeah. Now we'll firstly uh, give the awards for yesterday's best speaker. So uh, the foreign and the Slovene one. Sara. <laughs> So yeah, um, it's our uh, great pleasure to announce the, the results of yesterday's voting. So um, just a second, Feli, could you maybe take the camera and take the photos because we need them for sponsors, <laughs> that's the technical part. Um, yeah, uh, let's start with the yesterday's the best Slovenian speaker and I'm happy he's here. This is Matic Gornik for the debate about uterus transplantation. <laughs> Best foreign speaker of yesterday, uh, of yesterday was our uh, third time competing uh, contestant, and this is Maria Kusulia from Zagreb, uh, from Bijeka. So. so that I don't make it wrong. What, what will today's lucky person get? I don't know. Okay. And the winner is Gregor Verček.
as we check the, um, so the registration list, as we are not wrong, um, Nina, I'm sorry, I don't know your surname. Zupancic, I'm sorry, was the only one here from the third year, and we are very glad you came. So what you get is the book on clinical examination <laughs> that you will need for your exam this year. That's great that you don't have it yet. <laughs> And now, is the voting over for today's best speakers? Do we have the box full of papers? Yeah? I think they are counting the votes. Great, so no, we just have to wait. <laughs> moment. Would you announce it? <laughs> so we are proud to conclude this Congress with giving out our two last um, gifts, which are Slovenian Internal Medicine book, used from four to six years at our faculty, and Harrison's Manual of Medicine, which is the newly published by Mladinska Kniga. No, it's not, it's newly sold there, I'm sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so let's start with the um, foreign speaker, uh, who was uh, Ginevra Razzonelli from uh, University of Bologna. Since she's not here anymore, we'll try to get her before she leaves for Italy. Otherwise, I will take it to her. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, Slovenian speaker. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it was the orthopedic session that impressed us the most, and it was Urban Brulz. Okay, so now it's time for the closing remarks. Or um, I would like to thank all of you for being here and for watching, uh, watching us from home or from wherever you are. Um, thank you very much to all the active and passive participants in the name of the organizing committee. And see you next time, next year. <laughs>